session. We are delighted to have everyone join us today on this webinar. And it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you all. We have esteemed panelists with us, and I would like to introduce them to you. We have Dr. Naresh Agarwal from uh, Simon University, US. We have with us Dr. Jonah Richardson from uh, Australia. So we will be shortly joined by Jesus Lu from uh, Mexico. So I would like to extend my acknowledgement to our guest speaker who have extended their support and showed a commitment to this webinar. So it would have not be possible without their continued support. The way we've been uh, working on that webinar and the way we are going to make it happen is because of our panelists. And this webinar is offered to you with, uh, in a collaboration between Sir Sadiq Muhammad Khan Library and Department of Library and Information Science under uh, the leadership of Professor Dr. Rubina Bhatti. Uh, we also like to uh, thank for the support by the worthy Vice Chancellor, the Islamia University of Bahawalpur, Professor Dr. Uh, Atar Mehboob Saab. Uh, so uh, uh, the goal of today webinar uh, is, is not just having a single perspective. Therefore, we brought together three speakers from three different countries, Australia, America, and uh, Mexico. They will share uh, the different spectrum perspective as well as the changing dynamics and uh, uh, implications and uh, and uh, uh, the best practices towards uh, uh, research support services in the library. So it's a good opportunity for our participants to take a time to in a learning activity as well as uh, to interact with our distinguished speakers who are with us in answer question mm -hmm. sessions. So for vote of thanks, I would like to invite for up to a person who has worked really hard to bring this webinar to you. Please join me in thanking and welcoming Professor Dr. Rubina Bharti for vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Suman. <clears throat> Bismillah ar Honorable Vice Chancellor, esteemed speakers, information professionals here, faculty members who are online or on site, research scholars and their students. On behalf of Sir Sadiq Muhammad Khan University Library and Department of Library and Information Science, the Islamic University of Bahawalpur, I'm so happy to warmly welcome you in today's webinar. It is my great, ple great pleasure to welcome our esteemed uh, uh, speakers from Australia, Dr. Joanna Richardson, uh, Dr. Naresh Agarwal from uh, USA, and Professor Jesus Lau from Mexico. Thanks a lot for joining us despite your busy schedule and uh, the obvious difference in our time zone. But I'm so glad that we are able to gather together and participate in this webinar despite the tough pandemic period. I was looking forward to host you all honorable guests here in Bahawalpur, but we are unable to do so due to the given situation. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, <coughs> today's webinar on research sports, resources, services, and best practices is really a very important top topic. University libraries are responsible for providing uh, all the resources and services facilities for promoting research, uh, teaching, and learning of universities. Uh, though these teaching and learning are important aspects of universities, but more uh, emphasis on research. So today's discussion obviously would help us how to best support and facilitate our researchers, our faculty members um, for research. So thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I think we should start our webinar now. 
the first speaker I think Dr. Suman is going to invite. I'm so delighted to have you once again. Very many thanks for RTD from all uh, my library professionals and my faculty members. Thank you. Uh, I know your time is valuable. So I will uh, cut to the chase and I would like to introduce our first guest speaker, Dr. Naresh Agarwal. Uh, Naresh Agarwal is an associate professor and director of information science and technology concentration at the School of Library and Information Science at Simmons University, Boston. Naresh research area is information behavior and knowledge management. His first book, Exploring context in information behavior, seeker situation surrounding and shared identifier were published by Morgan and Claypole in 2018. His second book, You Know the Glory, Not the Story, 25 Journey Toward Ikigai is coming out in 2021. And we are excited, really excited to read that book. He has been a keynote invited speaker at workshop and conferences in different countries, including in the US, Japan, France, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and South Africa. Naresh has held various leadership positions at the Association for Information Science and Technology. He was a member of his board of director, co-chaired his annual meeting in 2017, and was awarded the Asset James M. Karash Leadership Award in 2012. He is currently the president-elect of ACID. And I would like to mention here that he is the very first from, from the Asia who has been elected for this position. It's, it's a pride for all of us. Uh, prior to entering the doctor program at NERSE, Naresh worked for six years in technology roles in the voice over IP, bioinformatics, and digital cinema industries. Among other things, Agarwal has been a debater and public speaker and likes a paint in water, kura and oil. So over to Dr. Naresh, please go ahead for your presentation and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Salman Naim and, uh, and <clears throat> Professor Rubina Bhatti for inviting me to, to this talk today. And I'm so glad to be joined by Joanna Richardson, who is a Simmons alumna. I'm so glad to, to know that and Dr. Uh, here's us loud uh, over here. So, so it's, it's really wonderful to be able to join here right now. I know we are all in different time zones. It's uh, early morning for you in Pakistan. I think it's uh, somewhere between 10, 13 and 11 in the morning. And it's uh, here almost 1 a.m. for us uh, here in Boston. So I'm going to share my slides now. And you can let me know if you can see it. Yes, we can see. I'm just waiting for it. I think the display went black. Okay, yeah. So thank you. So the, I'm going to focus. Uh, so the talk, uh, the, the primary theme of this uh, panel today is on research support in university libraries. And uh, I'm going to talk, take a broad, way, uh, broad uh, view on this and talk about a few things. Uh, I'm going to talk about myself a bit then talk about research in general, because we have a varied audience from what I can understand. So before we talk about how can libraries provide support for research, I think it's important for us to understand what do we mean by research. And then uh, what Simmons Library and what some libraries in general provide support for in terms of research, what do we mean by knowledge management? And what are the what more do we need to do in terms of providing research support? And how can KM knowledge management help towards that? So with that, my theme here would be knowledge management for research support in, in university libraries. And this is a picture of the BT library in the Simmons University campus uh, in downtown uh, Boston. So uh, a bit about me, um, I was born in the uh, northeastern part of uh, India, surrounded by Nepal to the west, Bhutan to the east, and then uh, Tibet, uh, or China to the to the northern part uh, over here. So this is a mountain lake to the northern part of Sikkim, and uh, this is a high school that, that I that I went to. On a clear sunny day, you can see Mount Kanchenjunga over here, which is the third highest mountain in the world. And uh, this is the main street where, where my house is in. It's called uh, Mahatma Gandhi Mark or MG Mark, and uh, 
it's it's quite famous for for tourists uh, uh, to visit at, at uh, most times of the year. And uh, this is uh, a very high high altitude airport which they built quite recently uh, in Sikkim because we didn't really have an, an airport like though we had helipads. And uh, from 1995, after finishing my 12th grade in, in India, I went to Singapore for higher education. I got a scholarship to study in Singapore. And uh, so this is just a view of uh, Singapore as it's as it is now. And this was Nanyang Technological University where I did my undergrad in computer engineering. And I worked for six years in the industry, which was, which was largely in Singapore and a few months in Silicon Valley in California and a few months in India as well. And I came back to Singapore to do my PhD at the National University of Singapore, uh, where I did my PhD in information systems in the School of Computing. And uh, currently I, I live in Boston. So this is where we are and this is where you guys are. And uh, I know that Joanna is here in Australia and then uh, we have Dr. Lau from, from Mexico. So this is the, the small and beautiful campus of uh, Simmons University and uh, which is in the, in the heart of Boston. So we, we have a five story car park right underneath this. And these are all, all the buildings right now. There's there'll be a new tower that will be coming up uh, on to, on top of the science building here at this at this spot. So we'll be we'll have construction going on for a while now. And this is the main college building. And this is uh, Boston and Massachusetts uh, in the fall. And uh, this was a few weeks ago. And uh, so this is winter, a, a typical winter scene in Boston uh, right now in December, January until March or April is going to be like this. So let's uh, go on to talking about uh, what we mean by, by research. So one of the questions for many of the attendees here, I think uh, even though we talk a lot about research, I think is how do we define research or what we mean when we talk about research. And that is not a trivial question because sometimes we find that different people have different levels of understanding of what we think or what we mean by research. So one definition which is quite widely used is that uh, research is uh, any any inquiry uh, which is carried out at least to some degree by a systematic method with the purpose of eliciting some new facts, concepts, or ideas. And when we think of a research article, when we think of whether, how to identify whether a piece of writing is research or not, uh, there are some typical, typical questions. Typically, a, a research paper would have research questions. Uh, and then when we think of a research question, typically for PhD students, it's a big problem to solve. They, sometimes we can have students spending up to six months or a year or sometimes even two years you know, in order to try to identify the question that you're interested in. Because sometimes whatever question we're interested in, we might spend uh, maybe 10 years or 20 years or more of our lives trying to investigate that question or related questions uh, to our research. And this was uh, an article by my colleagues uh, Peter Hunnan and Candy Schwartz, who were both the co-editors of uh, Library and Information Science Research, and, uh, and now they're both retired. And uh, they wrote a, an editorial, which, which I often give to my, to my students, called, uh, What is a Problem Statement? And uh, I thought this is an interesting and an important uh, uh, editorial, because, uh, and I find this, is a, this as a problem in most student writing a lot of the times, because the problem is not clearly stated. And they, in their editorial, write that any problem in any research article needs to have four components. One is the general lead-in as to what is the general problem, something to, to set this, set the stage, and then talk about what's missing. So, for instance, uh, for our current uh, question, we would say that uh, academic libraries or university libraries provide various kinds of services to students. However, we do not know, in the changing scenario, whether the services provided by libraries are enough or not in order to fulfill the research requirements. So that would be the de declaration of originality. Does this particular study or this particular panel discussion today would bring about international perspectives to see how libraries could provide uh, services uh, for research? So that would be the focus of the study. And then the benefit would be the, four, the fourth component. So these are the four central pieces which typically should go into the beginning part of any research article in order to set the stage. And then, uh, my own research area, uh, at, the, at the heart of it is the actor or the user. And this person could be a knowledge worker, a medical resident in a hospital setting, a library employee, a, a library and information science student. It could be even a child or a preschooler. It could be people connecting to a 
Zoom webinar virtually, and it could be international attendees joining in from different parts of the world. It could be people sitting in a, in a, in a particular room in Bahawalpur. So there are various people who could be the sector or the user. And at some point, we have some need for information. For instance, a need to understand what kind of service, research services could libraries provide. And when we have some need for information, we go about this task of looking for information. And we could go to, to friends or colleagues. We could go to a reference desk in the library, or we could borrow books from the library, or could, we could have manuals that we have. Or we could look for information from computer-based systems, and we could connect to these using a desktop, a laptop, a tablet, and so on. And sometimes we find information serendipitously when we're not really looking for it. So as we get this information, we try to make sense of it. And some of our questions get answered. We get, we get more questions, and then the cycle sort of continues. And uh, sometimes we avoid information. So if sometimes, like, like one of the things which I didn't want to know was the number of COVID counts in particular countries. At some point, I get, that became a kind of information which sometimes people do not want to know. And my focus here was in trying to see what do people feel when their text messages or messages on WhatsApp or, or Facebook Messenger and, and so on are not responded to calls and messages. And so that was a study that I was doing for the past two years or so. And this entire thing can be seen off as human information behavior. And the other area that I'm interested in is knowledge management, which is also looking at a similar field. But rather than looking at it from an individual's point of view, knowledge management is looking at uh, the phenomena from an organization's point of view, which is that uh, how can you make sure that an organization is able to utilize all its knowledge assets and all the resources in the most effective manner such that its organizational goals are served? So here it would be called information seeking, whereas in knowledge management, the phenomenon would be called knowledge sharing. So when we continue with the, looking at the components of research articles, so we, have, we talked about research questions. The second part would be a literature review. So here again, this is the, before we find out, before we try to investigate any new question, we, we have to figure out what's, the, what's out there. And libraries play a very important role in helping students carry out this literature review in, in terms of uh, providing resources and also in terms of uh, helping with searches, helping uh, understand the problem that uh, faculty members, researchers, students are trying to solve. And then uh, this whole uh, process of trying to scan the landscape of the research which is out there. And uh, this was uh, my book in 2018, which was uh, looking at context, uh, particularly in the context of human, human information behavior. And uh, so here, uh, I'll just pull out uh, a part of my book over here. So I came up with these various categories of variables and context. So one, you have the actor as a central uh, person who is interested in the finding, looking for information. And then you have a certain environment in which uh, this need for information arises. So the interaction between the actor and the environment gives rise to some task or activity based on which some information is required. And there's a certain relationship shared between the actor and the source of information. And in order, to, in order to fulfill this need for information, the person starts looking for information. And then there is this channel of information uh, that is there. So based on these seven categories of uh, contextual variables, I had this huge long list of uh, various variables that were studied, uh, done in previous studies that, were, that have been studied in library and information science. And I explained in this book over here that how can research studies be designed incorporating context and information behavior so you could pick a certain set of uh, variables over there, and from there you could design a diagrammatic causal research model looking at the relationships between, um, let's say here there are variables relating to the quality of a particular source, how much does a person know, and how easy or difficult it is to reach a particular source. Is it easy or difficult to communicate with that source and to see the effect of that on a person's choice of information sources or a person's views of source, and there could be other, other factors that affect that. So, these variables, the cho choice of variables and the design of research models uh, that form an important part in, uh, in, in uh, especially in quantitative um, and positivist uh, research studies. So other components, uh, there would be some method uh, typically of data gathering. You could also have conceptual and theoretical articles or you could have survey studies or you could have usability and, ob and observation research. You could have experiments, you could have uh, content analysis and various methods of, of gathering data. So data forms are a very important part when we, because most of the time, a research can be about either coming up with uh, testing a theory or then arriving at a theory. And uh, most of the time we have some hypothesis which we need to then test using gathering our data. 
and then uh, we finally we have an analysis and discussion and limitations and future work and so on. So this is uh, again uh, a good resource. Uh, this is by the. Let me pull this out. Yeah. So this is uh, called uh, the uh, research uh, research methods knowledge base. It's a social science research. So it's a good book which has been uh, online for many years now, and it's by Professor William Trokim. And anyone who wants to learn about research, social science research, so he provides a, a very detailed uh, roadmap as to understanding the sampling, measurement, design, analysis, various types of reliability and validity, and so on. And uh, there is this uh, table of contents with uh, all the things that we need to think about. Like, are we really measuring what we think we're measuring when we talk about research and so on? And uh, in 2014, uh, uh, so the, in my first few years at Simmons, I was teaching a course called Evaluation of Library of Information Services, which was trying to look at various library services and, and to see how uh, library employees could carry out systematic evaluation uh, over there by using research methods. And uh, I used to have our Simmons librarian, uh, Linda Watkins, come and talk to our students to talk about how students could use the library resources to carry out, uh, uh, carry out the literature review. And Linda always mentioned that of all the research articles and periodicals that were there in the Simmons library, a very small number was actually research. And she used to say that uh, someday before I retire, I'm actually going to conduct a research to see what's the actual number of, uh, what's the actual percentage of research among all the periodicals that the library subscribed to. So one fine day I told Linda that Linda has been a few years that you've been telling this and you might retire soon, so why not we carry out the study? So I got one student interested in it. And uh, so Mirna Tercios, uh, uh, Linda and I, we collaborated and we carried out this research to see how much of LIS uh, literature actually qualifies as, uh, as research, which was published in the Journal of Academic Librarianship. So this is the, the this was the paper that was there uh, that we uh, published. And uh, we had a, a, a few things that we were interested in over here. So from for we looked at the research articles uh, that the library subscribed to, which, had, which were in the LIS field. And then we looked at, again, does the article have a research question, literature review, method, data, data analysis, discussion, and so on, to see if it qualifies as research, what was the method used. And uh, these are the various types of research methods that we identified uh, in those articles, content analysis, interviews, focus groups, usability, classroom research, action research, and so on. And these, this was the entire list of uh, periodicals uh, in the LIS uh, field that, that the library subscribed to it. So it had journals like the Journal of the Association of Information Science and Technology. Then you had uh, a journal of uh, library and information yeah. science research, knowledge quest, and so on. And of all these uh, articles, uh, this was the, the, we found that survey method was, uh, was largely used. And then uh, case studies content analysis was about 13%, and then the other types of methods was, was very rarely used um, in research. And these were the, uh, the keywords that, were, that we found, information libraries and so on. And we found that only about, uh, uh, only 16% um, of all the articles analyzed in the study was qualified as, as research from all the periodicals that the library subscribed to in the LIS field. The rest was not really research. And uh, I also wanted to uh, just show this uh, the Google Scholar uh, metrics. So Google Scholar provides uh, a, a top view of, uh, of various uh, publications which are there. And then we could sort, this will show you the top journals in, in any field. And you could go to various categories. We could go to social sciences. And then in subcategories, we could, let's say we go to library and information science. So it will show you the top journals uh, in this field. So. The Association for Information Science and Technology runs the top journal, which is JSIST uh, in the field, and there are other journals which are again in the top 20 in LS. And this list keeps changing uh, with time. So then now let's talk about the research support in university libraries with some uh, a brief overview of what we mean by, by research. What are the services, resources, and best practices which was there in the theme for this uh, panel today? So this is the library building at Simmons. and. Uh, this is the entrance that we have, the circulation desk, and uh, various books and periodicals are, of course, the services that uh, libraries are known for in, in terms of providing. 
And in Simmons, we have a, a nice uh, moving racks that we have. So you move, press the button and move it uh, left and right, and we can, we can save the physical space. So the bookshelves will actually move electronically as you press the button. So you can have more shelves uh, in a given space. And uh, one important service is the, the Ask a Librarian service where you have your reference desk, uh, uh, which is there, there in the library. And this is a, an important service that, uh, where, you, where you can actually go with, when you're unsure about your the problems that you want to solve, then the librarian can help you over there. Technology access, of course, a lot of people do not have easy technology access to. The library becomes a very important place for people to access the internet or to provide, uh, to have technology access. But these days, a lot of people have their own devices and phones uh, or, or laptops, tablets, and so on. So apart from uh, ac access to computers, you also have uh, need access to both Wi-Fi as well as uh, enough of power outlets. Uh, those become important services in the library. And uh, we also need uh, collaboration, collaborative workspaces, and people are working together in teams. So the library also comes across as a place to provide this uh, collaborative uh, learning space. And this was an interesting picture. It is from 1919, and it is uh, Simmons University students and patrons at work in the Simmons uh, Social Work Library at uh, 10 Somerset Street. And this is from the Simmons Library Archives. So the library has all has always been uh, a place both to to borrow things, uh, uh, to read, and as well as for research, and also to uh, to provide a space for collaboration between people who are interested in in research. So collaborative learning spaces become uh, becomes an important uh, place for libraries. And there are other services uh, like interlibrary loan, uh, research guides, ebooks, e journals, databases, uh, a writing center, and so on. So I'll just show you the page of the uh, the Simmons the library page. So uh, there's an integrated search over here, which was uh, implemented a few years ago uh, because it was trying to replicate why people go to Google and other search engines for, and there's a search for databases and, and so on. So there are the services to do with the finding and borrowing books, and then there are services to do with research and study, which is meet the librarian, explore tutorials, research guides, course guides, and so on. So research, research guides are, again, an important service that libraries provide. So here you can have uh, research guides to do with dis different disciplines. Uh, so I'll just click on library science over here. So here we have my, co my colleague, which she is the, li the librarian for our school, uh, Linda Schuller. And uh, here, the, here uh, she has compiled this page with a number of resources uh, in terms of uh, finding articles on your given topic, and then uh, books on LIS history theory, and then things to do with uh, write writing and citing. Uh, the services, the APA, the style guide, and other, other online citation tools, and uh, how to do a literature review, and so on. So now let's talk about uh, knowledge management. Uh, so when, we, when asked, most company executives say that the greatest asset is the knowledge held by the employees. And they also state that they have no idea how to manage uh, this knowledge. So the, typically there, there are a large number of definitions uh, for knowledge management. But uh, one of the definitions is that it's a process of capturing your company's collective expertise, uh, wherever it resides in databases on paper in people's heads and distributing it to whoever, wherever it can help produce the biggest payoff. So when we say a company, this is how, where it started off. It's uh, knowledge management started off in the you know, early 90s or so with, and largely in, in for-profit companies. But uh, it is also now used for in nonprofits and universities, and increasingly there have been, been a call for libraries to adopt knowledge management. So academic libraries and university libraries also have, have, a, have a big use and, uh, for knowledge management now. So there are two types of knowledge which is often talked about in knowledge management. One is the explicit knowledge, which is what can be captured in the books that we write or the, the articles that we write or, or what we give in, in terms of a talk. So when you talk to people, what can be stored or, or which is there on the surface. So that is a, what, you, what we hear people say, that, well, hear from people is actually a very small part of what people know. So what we know is often much more than what we, what we are able to tell other people. And that's a big, the deeper part of the knowledge that, we hold, that people hold. So typically when, when you think of, think of knowledge management, most people think of implementing a knowledge management system in a company or a library or any other place. 
and sometimes it uh, it is trying to make sure that uh, finding ways in which we can make this knowledge available to people and uh, even books books right uh, there's this uh, there's uh, professor brenda derwin uh, who i'm very influenced by and she came up with the sense making methodology and brenda says that uh, a lot of the times right uh, people think that information is something that uh, is a brick that we throw at people and people's heads are supposed to be like empty uh, empty buckets which are expected to catch the bricks that are thrown to them and uh, the books can be seen of books in a library can be seen as caves with with bricks literally and just providing a book or providing a resource is not enough sometimes we have to connect people with the answers that they need so the tacit knowledge uh, is important because in knowledge when you implement knowledge management you do not you not only connect people with the resources or the databases that might help them but you also connect them to other people who can help answer their questions so connecting people to people is very is an important part of, of knowledge management where you can help allow for this tacit transfer of knowledge from one person to the other. So tacit knowledge has the ability to adapt to deal with new and exceptional situations and the uh, ability to collaborate, to share a vision, to transmit a culture. And explicit knowledge is easy to reproduce, easy to access and to teach, um, easy to, to systematize. So books and all, they, they serve this purpose. And this is a very famous model by Nonaka and Takeuchi. It's known as the knowledge spiral model, where whenever we want to have uh, facilities for tacit to tacit uh, transfer, we need to provide mechanisms for socialization, brainstorming, coaching, and so on. So this webinar today is actually a good example of a tacit to tacit knowledge transfer, where the knowledge that we, that we might have, well, we have we have a platform to, tra to transfer some of that to those of, uh, those of you who are listening today, so that there is uh, this amount of uh, tacit to toilet, tacit knowledge exchange. Tacit to explicit is when we are capturing or sharing in the form of writings uh, that we do, the papers that we write and so on. And uh, explicit to explicit is when we are writing summaries of things or classifying them in some, some way, taxonomies that, it, that we come up with. And explicit to tacit is when we read a book, when we read something that is written out there and then we try to understand, we try, try to learn from it. So these are the various ways in which knowledge exchange can happen in, in any organization and or even within a library or in a university environment. And this uh, sort of this spiral continues. And this was the outcome of one of the papers that, that I did with Anwar Islam from Dhaka University, Bangladesh. And uh, we were looking at uh, the knowledge transfer processes in uh, library employees, uh, out outgoing library employees and incoming employees in the library and what mechanisms were used uh, over there for this knowledge transfer. So they were similar to, to the mechanisms that we saw in the previous slide. And there are various processes for knowledge cycle. Uh, so knowledge capture and creation is one part of it. Sharing and access is the other part. And application and reuse uh, are the ones. So the, whatever mechanisms we think of, uh, we have to try to create uh, facilities for, uh, for, for these things to happen. So even when we think of uh, academic libraries providing uh, make research know-how to faculty and students. Uh, so we have to think of uh, what, what are the mechanisms we can think of in terms of providing ways for knowledge caption and creation, ways for knowledge sharing and access, and ways for knowledge application and reuse uh, within the library setting. So this was uh, one of the papers uh, that had from 2014, which talked about various kinds of tools and mechanisms for these kinds of knowledge cycle processes. So I'll just uh, show this briefly. So this was the paper on, on, on knowledge uh, tools and technologies. So here uh, we basically came up with a long list of, uh, um, we, we had this uh, as kind of our, our framework, tools for knowledge caption creation, tools for knowledge sharing, dissemination, and tools for knowledge application and reuse. And uh, we, we came up with this whole, uh, these are non-technology tools for knowledge caption and creation, like action learning, ad hoc sessions, brainstorming, getting guest speakers, knowledge cafe. And then you had uh, technology tools like co-browsing uh, to and various examples of tools are provided over here, tools for collaborative writing and so on. And then similarly, there are tools for knowledge sharing, uh, uh, video recording, whiteboarding, and then collaborative physical uh, workspaces, communities of practice, and then software tools that can provide uh, things like messaging and chat and so on and large audience webinars that, like, like the one we have right now. That is one of the, one of the knowledge, man, knowledge sharing tools. And there are uh, tools for knowledge uh, application and use as, as well. And uh, 
this second paper is about how how can we what is the silver bullet or what what is the way in which universities uh, can go about implementing knowledge management and this would also apply to to academic libraries so in this paper with uh, Leila Maru from Kuwait University uh, what we do is that we propose a 10 step process uh, for implementing uh, knowledge management so i think towards the end we have this uh, we have a table uh, over here where we provide like a like a, a steps as to find a champion and then uh, get a team get people to buy in and then how to go about doing the designs implementing and scaling up as to what are the steps to to happen in terms of uh, implementing knowledge management now the value proposition here in this particular case is about uh, can be very different but for the for today's panel it would be about uh, providing the li libraries providing research services to its patrons uh, academic library so that would be the value proposition and then you need to find out what are the things that you need to be in place for this particular value proposition and uh, this was another paper uh, where we looked at the effect of knowledge management on the service innovation in, in academic libraries which was published in the ifla journal and uh, so this was published in 2017 and we carried out a survey of 107 librarians for, from 39 countries in, in this and we came up with this uh, framework for innovation in library services. So firstly, you implement knowledge management and gather the knowledge of user needs and possibilities for innovation. Like what is the concept of services? What kind of interface do you provide, want to provide to the patrons? Uh, what are the technology options and so on? And what are the barriers to innovation? And then you analyze and synthesize all this overcome barriers and which can lead to innovation in the in services that we provide. So. Uh, I think the important part here is the, the questions that we have. So in terms of innovation, um, in terms of like, one is the user interface, uh, the OPAC or the website or mobile apps, mobile website, effective presence in social media, and service delivery system through autom automated circulation, interlibrary loan, online reference, and so on, state-of-the-art technology, RFID, QR code, digital libraries. And then uh, what are the ways for knowledge capture over here that libraries can provide? So learning by interacting amongst ourselves through, through library employees reference circulation about the needs of our users, talking about innovation possibilities, uh, and what the concept of service means for the library and its users, what the user interface should be like, and what kind of service delivery system can we have, and what technology options can we adopt, what are the barriers that we face. For knowledge sharing, again, again a lot of the times, uh, a library is seen as a one-way street, sort of providing services and resources to its patrons, but uh, there could be value co-creation where the library works with the users uh, in terms of trying to provide uh, come up with services rather than just providing a one-way service so you can have more informal dialogues face-to-face -face meeting and group discussions uh, on knowledge sharing and you can capture best practices and lessons learned uh, provide frequent uh, people frequently share the knowledge they've gathered on user needs innovation possibilities and so on and then the, the last part was about knowledge application and use like how is the knowledge that is captured uh, used in terms of overcoming barriers and, and for innovation? So, and there's been an increasing call for knowledge management uh, in libraries. So we, we looked at this figure earlier in the, in the paper in terms of value proposition, where the proposition today is uh, looking at the research services that academic libraries can provide. So let's go on to the main part of uh, the talk today in terms of what are the things we can do in terms of increasing the research support uh, by university libraries and uh, any role that knowledge management can play in that. So we earlier looked at uh, the components of research article, which means that if a student or a faculty member or, or any person is coming up with all of these, a library needs to provide support for all of these various things in terms of the services that it provides. And services for coming up with, coming up with research questions, services for, look, for finding, look, finding the relevant literature and also in terms of data analysis and so on and data, data, data gathering support if, if a library can help in that. So one, a top uh, service of course is access, access to databases, access to top journals and access is a big problem because I find that a lot of developing countries do not have subscription to databases which are often expensive and a lot of uh, vendors they sometimes bundle services and do not, do not provide uh, journals in affordable ways to, to different countries. So you need physical and electronic access and Google Scholar is a good uh, way to search for, uh, here let, uh, is to search for a lot of articles and, and to see articles that, that are uh, 
so, um, PDF uh, uh, articles that uh, uh, can be found for a lot of them. Like this is, uh, I was just searching for problem statements. So yes, yeah, so HTML and PDF, so many of the articles uh, can be found in this. Go back to this one. Okay. And then there is uh, this question of uh, open access, because uh, since many of the journals are are expensive and not accessible, there has been a movement over the past decade or so to, uh, in in looking at uh, at open access and trying to come up with a whole series of journals which are more affordable for for people. And DOAJ is uh, a directory of uh, open access journals. So here you can find uh, open access journals and articles, uh, and there are a huge number of journals, more than 15,000 journals over here. But of course, we have to be careful because some are predatory journals which are out, just out there to make, make money and do not provide quality articles. But, but there are other important journals, like for instance, uh, if you look at information research, uh, this is an, uh, a very reputable electronic journal in, uh, in library and information science. So, here they, they have all these articles are open access uh, over here. And then you have uh, this thing called Sherpa Romeo. Now this is a service where if you're a faculty member, you can make your own research article available on your website or in the, in the university the library as well. And, uh, but you do not know to what extent, what are the policies of a particular journal on this. So Sherpa Romeo provides a service where you can check for this policy. So for instance, uh, if we go here, uh, let's say I search for uh, uh, Journal of the Association for Information Science uh, and Technology. So I will get to know what are the policies uh, of this particular journal in terms of making a published version, version accessible or, or like you can, uh, if, you, if you go look on this published version, right, then it has an open access fee associated with it and uh, the, you, the, you could take an accepted article and you could put it in your institutional repository. But, you, but they, they do not allow your published article to go in there. So, do, so do you can actually check for different journals in terms of what version of your article can you put into your institutional repository. So what I had done was that I created my research page on my website. And here I had uh, various articles. And in some of them, I provide the author version. And some I provide the publisher version, depending on the policies of these various journals. And uh, so that way you could, you could check in terms of what you can make available, which version can you make available for your different uh, journals. And then uh, the library could also serve as a publisher. So you could manage your faculty publications and, and you could also take faculty data because now there's a mandate in terms of lots of research grants to make data freely available as well. And uh, Scholar Simmons is one example where you could take the, the uh, the, your your published publications and depending on the journal policy, you could submit them them to your institutional repository, and different universities like for instance in your university in Bahawalpur, you could you could have your own repository. I'm not sure whether you actually currently have one or not, but the library could serve as a place to take faculty research and publish it in a, in a, in a common place. And currently at Simmons, uh, I'm part of the I'm the director of the Information Science and Technology concentration, so we just got a grant to start an Information Science and Technology lab. So what we want to do is again create a research group where we create a, a website and bring together all the research done by particular faculty in a, in a given area in information science and technology. Then uh, we looked at the earlier, the integrated search interface that library provides. You could have uh, an Ask a Librarian service, in-person, virtual, and mobile user services. So if people are not going to the library, the library could, could go to the people. The librarians could go to the place where research is, is happening, could go to classrooms, could go to students. And uh, an important service is, uh, which the library can provide is a writing center in terms of both how to write and how to cite and how, to, how not to plagiarize. And different universities are also adopting the Turnitin kind of software to, to make sure that students are able to cite sources uh, in, in the correct manner. Also, when you have written an article, there are different services provided for journal finder services to see which, which is the best journal suited to your work and support for accessibility and uh, universal design for, the, for catering to disability is an important service again, where the library should be uh, working hard towards. And uh, also as a space for collaboration because the library is not alone, it's part of a university, academic libraries. 
So in terms of uh, working with the other stakeholders in the university, like the faculty, staff, students, and administration, and the Office of Sponsor Programs in terms of uh, training for IRB and, and ethics, and working with, the, with funding agencies to help people get funding for research. So the library can be an important partner with a lot of people in, in taking their research climate overall in the university. And also there are uh, professional associations like ACIST, uh, Association of Information Science and Technology, uh, the Association of College and Research Libraries, uh, the International Federation for, for Library Associations. So all of these uh, can be important places to network, uh, to find, uh, uh, to again help, uh, to, uh, places to present uh, research and also to collaborate with other people. Uh, this is the ACIST uh, website. I just provided a link to that. Uh, So this is the Simmons Writing Center. Yeah, so this was about uh, uh, ACIST, uh, joining ACIST. So I'm part of the ACIST Board of Directors this year. So one, one uh, important uh, development has been that ACIST Board has voted to make uh, joining ACIST uh, free for members of uh, South Asia. So if you're in Pakistan right now, it, the, the membership is free to join. So I, think, so I would say that make use of that, that thing because uh, people in the US need to pay $150 a year to join the assist so, so it is uh, it is free for this year so i, so I would really encourage you to, to join the assist because it's a huge community of people uh, to be a part of and a few years ago we also started the south asia chapter of assist so uh, this brings together people in uh, india pakistan bangladesh and surrounding countries nepal bhutan sri lanka maldives and so on so again this is, this is a good place to network and be a part of a, a part of a community over here so mentorship is an important part because uh, people who are well versed in research need to be able to mentor other people, both in terms of carrying research as well as writing articles. So one of the ideas that I, I had was trying to start a virtual fellowship where I work with people in South Asia and other developing countries to guide them in their research. And you can collaborate with researchers from other countries to help improve research rigor. Also another important service which, where the library comes in is uh, media literacy and news literacy. Information literacy, of course, has been a big part of, uh, uh, of libraries. And I think uh, uh, Professor Lau will, will talk more of, of that later. But uh, here uh, the role of the library comes in terms of cr critical thinking and helping fight uh, fake news. And this was a, a framework for fighting fake news that we presented uh, in 2020 at the ACIST uh, conference. And the library will play a very important part uh, in terms of helping with the crit critical thinking. And finally, I just wanted to the, show this uh, website that I'd started uh, a few years ago, and uh, where my quest is to, and I just got a research grant on this, and the quest is to try and interview people to find, find out their research journeys. So because the journals articles will tell us something, but when we talk to people, we really get to know the trajectories that they follow in terms of trying to understand uh, uh, research and, and how what happened during the careers as well. So this will have a series of uh, interviews in it. So we looked at a number of things that libraries can come and one of the things we can talk brainstorm is that where of which of these uh, would lead to what kind of knowledge exchange and maybe one kind of service will apply to more of these quadrants than any any particular one. So that was all I know it was very broad and I wanted to cover like a broad uh, give a give a broad overview. And I'm ready for your questions. And uh, and this is the cover of the book uh, that I'm currently like about to finish right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Naresh, for your comprehensive, in-depth, detailed uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure all the participants have learned and got out of this presentation. So we'll move forward for question answer question, uh, session. So I would request to our participants, if they have any question, they can uh, ask their question. They will raise their, their hand. Yes. Uh, one uh, question was about how can uh, we get a copy of a presentation? So I think Dr. Salman and Dr. Bhatti have the copies of the slides. Maybe you can share with people yeah. later. Yes. Uh, Uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Omar Shafiq, you can ask your question, please. Uh, Dr. Omar, you have raised your hand. I guess you have a question. Please ask your question. Uh, 
you are unmuted. <clears throat> Dr. Shafiq, we are waiting for your uh, question, please. Do you have a question? Yes, he's trying okay, to... Okay, go to the next... Uh, okay, uh, so one interesting thing about uh, Dr. Shafiq is that I met him uh, when I was a PhD student, I'd gone for a workshop to Hong Kong, and that is where we met for the first time. And I was in Singapore at that time, and he had come. And uh, so, and he just told me that uh, he's from Bahalpur, so it was really interesting to, uh, and, and I'm glad that he was able to join the presentation today. And uh, there was a question from uh, Nuruddin Merchant uh, asking that how can I, how as a full time librarian, I can manage research? Please share full tips. So, I think as I think there has to be a very active faculty librarian collaboration. So you can uh, work with uh, other faculty who are guiding people on the research. And then uh, I think as a team, it has to be a collaboration between, between uh, as a librarian and with, with faculty and students, I think. So thank you. I think uh, Naveed and, uh, and Abega Benis, uh, they say that they enjoyed the presentation. Any other questions? Naveed want to ask, let me allow him to talk. Okay. Yes, Naveed, you can ask your question. Please unmute yourself and ask. Well, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, we can. Uh, thank you very much. And that was very informative for us as a librarian. So the last, uh, in the last uh, slide that you show, where you provide an interview regarding the some sort of projects but yeah. I just skip the URL. Can you please repeat the URL where you provide the your interview? Yes. Uh, I'll just share that with you again. I'm going to share the screen. And the URL is uh, Project Oneness World. So it is www.projectonenessworld.com. Mm, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Project Oneness World. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I just wanted to the, convey this idea of oneness, saying that uh, even though we are uh, uh, like we are geographically distant and we come from different ethnicities and different uh, fields and so on, but we are one as human beings in terms of a desire to be, to be loved, uh, to love in order to be accepted and, and so on. So that's where those different voices are, is something that I'm hoping to capture through that. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Dr. Naresh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Khurshid Ahmed, and we have been in contact, like I have been in Nanjing, and I think uh, your one of student is working on collaborative learning. Collaborative, yeah, yeah. Hi, Dr. Khurshid, yeah. Yeah, so we have been, I think, in contact through email. Thank you. Thank so you. my uh, question is, how can we uh, apply collaborative learning toward library practices and KM? So uh, KM is, is all about collaboration in the sense that it is all, even though it has various parts of the knowledge cycle, it is about uh, knowledge sharing. So for instance, let's talk about uh, your university, right? Now, Islam University of Bahalpur. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much each, each person knows? Do you know what each person in your room knows uh, among the faculty? A lot of the times we don't know what each of us knows. So one of the things when we do a knowledge audit is trying to find out what we know. And that is where we can, uh, it can be a, a, as a first beginning where we st comprehensively start creating an environment uh, where firstly it is okay not to know, where we, where we, where we share things in, pro in process. And, uh, and I, I think uh, one of the ways in which in my university, we had a new provost and something very interesting that she did was that she started faculty lunches and teas where the teas and lunches were sponsored. So people would go there for food. And because of that, people started talking and that led to a lot of research collaborations and collaboration between the library and faculty and so on within, within a few months. So I think you're just having simple places where, where people gather for, for chai, for, for tea, like coffee, all of that, right, can be a, a very important uh, places for, uh, for collaboration. I think having more and more informal uh, talking spaces. Thank you. And I think there was a question from Nuruddin Merchant. Uh, what is the value and authenticity, and authenticity of bibliometrics and scientometric research? A lot of librarians and faculty members are now producing research in this area. Yes, I think uh, 
bibliometrics. So I've also done uh, one or two studies lately in bibliometrics where we looked at the relationship between LIS research and knowledge management research. And we found the reason we did that was because uh, it allowed us to gather data without really talking to people. So in a, in a way, you didn't really have to go through IRB and then talk about uh, uh, ethics committees and, and, and all of that. And you could straight away get access to the resources and start analyzing it. So, so, it, so I think that, that could be one reason why a lot of people are doing it. But it's important because it gives us a lot of trends what have, in terms of research, what has happened in the past. And it allows us to understand something that we don't know much about. And then we can, that helps us into, into further research studies. So yes, it, it does have a value in terms of being one of the ways to, to gather data. Thank you. I guess uh, we should move to our uh, second presenter. Right. But can, I, can I do some comments? Thank you so much, Dr. Naresh, for your very uh, comprehensive and very thought-provoking uh, presentation on knowledge management for research support in university libraries. I really appreciate uh, how your university library, uh, Siemens University, uh, is supporting research by providing all the services. And I really like your idea of collaboration with all the stakeholders. We have to maintain the interpersonal relationship. I have also written the very first article um, when I completed my PhD that was on interpersonal relationships. We need to uh, develop that. And the library professionals, they do have work, but normally they do work in isolation. So uh, that, that you, as you said, that we need to have a cup of tea or a chai with, with them. So um, with the teachers, with the administration, you are indicating with the funding agencies there. And uh, com community inclusion is very important. So obviously we need to develop that. And uh, I think some of the library professions are focusing on that, but some do need to do that. They, to, uh, they do need to convince their funding agencies that this is what we are doing and this is what we're planning to do. Then they will be able to grab the funds from uh, different corners of at national level or international level too. Yeah. So thank you so much indeed. Thank you so much, Professor Fatih. And with the publishers, we do need to have a very good relationships with them. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Naresh uh, Agarwal, once again for your comprehensive uh, uh, presentation and the commitment you sh even showed even before the webinar. Uh, we really acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, now I would like to invite our uh, second guest speaker, Dr. Jonah Richardson. So I would like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Jonah Richardson. Uh, she is uh, as a scholarly communication consultant at Brisbane, Australia. Dr. Jonah received her Doctor of Philosophy from University of New England, New South Wales in 1985. She has been associated with Griffith University, Australia since April 2004 where she served in several positions such as library strategy advisor, associate director, scholarly content and discovery, acting manager and team leader. Previously, she was associated with Bond University as a social librarian during 1989 to 2002 at Brisbane. She was also associated with School of Information Studies, Wagga Wagga, New South Wales, Dr. Jonah has over 40 years of experience in university libraries. And we are really honored to have Dr. Jonah Richardson as our one of guest speaker. So I would like to invite her to please, Dr. Dr. Jonah, continue with your presentation, please. Thank you, Dr. Salman. Oh, we'll just bring it up. Oh, and thank you very much to Dr. Um, Agarwal for showing me pictures of snow, which I haven't seen for 40 years since I left Maine. Thank you. I don't miss shoveling that at all. And also greetings, muy buenas tardes, to Professor Jesus Lau, um, because actually I lived in Mexico and I also did some study there. And uh, as you can tell, I'm not Australian, I'm actually American. <laughs> but I won't be talking about Australia. I, really have tried to do this as an international context. 
So we will. Okay. I, I see that. I don't see you. <laughs> but I, are we fine there? We can see you. Oh, yes, okay. Oh, good. I'm glad I can't see myself. <laughs> so what you're, going to, you're, what you're going to see me doing is looking down at my notes, because of course, if I were actually presenting physically somewhere, you know, the great dual monitors you have where you see what the audience sees in the slides, and then you see your own notes. <laughs> and one thing about uh, retiring recently from Griffith University, but I am still affiliated with Griffith, which is why I've actually used their template for slides, um, is I do miss uh, having a dual monitor. <laughs> so I will be looking down at, at, at my notes because of course I can't see them or you'll see them too. And um, if uh, for any reason this presentation is shared, I have actually, what I'm going to be saying to you now is actually written as, uh, as, an, as a, a note for each of the slides so that um, there will be a context. Uh, this is Research Support in University Libraries, and I have um, attempted to give an international um, perspective. Uh, we're looking here at just a brief overview of some of the key principles that I want to cover. And I, in listening to Dr. Argawal, I was um, extremely- uh, uh, Dr. Jonah, would you mind if I interrupt you because we cannot see your slides on screen. Oh, okay. Let me try. Um, let's try again. Oh, that's not happening. Right. Uh, let's go back to you. And I should have share screen. Yes, share screen. Share screen. Isn't that a good idea? I forgot to do that. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So now that's why I wasn't seeing you. Sorry about that. Okay. Here we go. Bingo. All right. So anyway, um, there we're all good, right? It's yes, perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine. Thank you. Glad I practiced this yesterday with Dr. Salman. <laughs> All right. This is the usual overview of some of the key points that I'd like to cover. No, no and you were saying something about when listening to Dr. Abwal. So I'm curious oh, that. Interestingly yeah. enough, in listening to your presentation, it's going to be really interesting. I have a different perspective from you, understandably, when you when I acknowledge that some of the people who have influenced me greatly in terms of library and information science and my work, especially in the last 20 years, uh, I, it will be obvious why I have that perspective. But we, interestingly, at the end, Dr. Iowa, we really come together, I think, in some of the key messages, so that'll be really obvious. I want to cover uh, some of the key aspects of the research environment in which both librarians and scholars find themselves. And uh, because I'm here in Australia, we have a <clears throat> custom, um, if we're presenting within this country, of um, opening with a statement known as acknowledgement of country. And it's really done in a spirit of reconciliation. And I am actually presenting on uh, land. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am presenting. I'd like to also pay my respects to elders past and present. But the real acknowledgements go to the following people, obviously to Professor Dr. Bhatti and to Dr. Salman for their kind invitation <clears throat> um, for me to be involved uh, today. And uh, I was really thrilled. In fact, when I was sent the poster and realized that I wasn't speaking all by myself, that I was going to get actually be on a panel and get to hear uh, perspectives from other uh, leaders in library and information science. To Yusuf Ali, I have to acknowledge Yusuf, um, who is, a, as it says, there is a PhD candidate. Uh, is my, or uh, are you seeing my, uh, these pictures coming over the top of the slide? I don't know how you see this. Is that interfering with the presentation? Uh, instead of going across the no, top, it, it, it doesn't interfere with the presentation. That's separate. No, okay. it's it's that I don't know how, how you see this. Uh, I have to thank and acknowledge Yusuf for having introduced me to the world of library and information science in Pakistan. <laughs> um, two key people who helped, as I say, provide a 
a much richer perspective, I think, on the role of libraries and the potential role of libraries. And these are people who are who also had a role uh, at international level. Uh, Linda O'Brien, with whom I've collaborated, if you ever look at uh, my ORCID ID and publications. I, I acknowledged Linda because she, I was fortunate enough, I not only worked with her or for her, and she was a supervisor, but we actually were colleagues. And she involved me in some key projects in library and information uh, <clears throat> uh, science uh, at Griffith University. And it really gave me an appreciation of the important role that libraries could play in supporting research. And Malcolm Wolski, uh, former director of e-research services, uh, e-research um, uh, specifically at Griffith, uh, supports highly specialized, or researchers doing highly specialized research using uh, specialized tools, doing high performance computing uh, and uh, uh, projects requiring uh, many times technical expertise. And Malcolm was one of, is one of those, well, he gave me really an insight into the complex world of researchers. Now I do, have done, and I'm still doing research but not in the way that Malcolm presented it to me, because of course he's, he was dealing with, as he research services does, researchers from STEM, science, technology, engineering, uh, mathematics and uh, medicine, as well as social science and, uh, and the humanities. Uh, and he had this, uh, well, he has this wonderful lateral thinking and it's always great, I think, if in a group you're working with, you have at least one lateral thinker because they really can push the envelope, as we say. They can get you to look at things quite differently than you might do traditionally. And what he did was he, again, gave me insights into, uh, well, what he did, we brainstormed actual concrete examples of how libraries could partner with a range of stakeholders, which goes to Dr. Agarwal's point at the end, or one of them, and look at where libraries by doing that could support researchers. He would come to me at the end of every year, the beginning of it, the next year and go, okay, what are we gonna write about this year? What are we gonna research? I wonder why researchers do this. <laughs> I wonder if libraries have a skill set that would help over here. And then we'd involve a, a, a number of people and go off and have a look. And it was absolutely fascinating and totally changed my perspective. So in fact, what, it's do, what it did was, and it'll be clear now why, uh, the focus for my talk really is more about research. <clears throat> the, um, these were the objectives as I understood really for today's webinar. And <clears throat> pardon me, um, also hopefully what what will be gained by um, anything that I, um, I might present. But as I said, I have chosen to focus on research support for data um, because of both its importance, which we'll have a look at very quickly, and its inherent challenges, some of which we, I think we've already looked at. Uh, a couple of key terms. Uh, as Yusuf knows, used to would do this in um, journal articles. <clears throat> I'm defining these two terms because it's to avoid awkwardness that can come from either wanting to use an, an inclusive but kind of lengthy term or category, such as library and information science in brackets, LIS professionals. That's really quite a mouthful when you're doing a presentation. It's fine when you're writing a journal article because you just use, you know, identify the acronym and, and away you go. So if I use library, when I use librarian here, it, it's meant to be the more inclusive um, a category because especially given some recent uh, survey results from recent uh, research project I'm involved with, um, uh, there are people working in libraries, of course, who don't necessarily have a degree in librarianship, they may come from computer science or some other area, but they work in the library. Scholars, um, 
I do refer to researchers specifically in this presentation, but I think there are times when we want to be more inclusive about a university community rather than just designated researchers. And uh, so scholars in this sense, when I refer to scholars, it includes academics because in many countries, uh, sorry, as one, faculty members may be required to combine both lecturing, teaching with, um, with uh, research. Um, that's highly contentious. Unfortunately, we're not going to go there with that. And of course you have graduate students. So there are a whole range of categories within a university, practitioners too, library practitioners, doing research. And, and scholar is, a, is a, I think a nice uh, comprehensive term that covers uh, those categories without having to enumerate all of them. I'm a big believer normally, because when, in, if I'm co-authoring with someone on a journal article, I'm the one that usually has to write the context, <laughs> you know, the environmental statement, the background, the why do we care, why is this important? And this quotation that you see on their screen <laughs> is actually what I wrote as, as the first paragraph in an introduction to a recent book chapter, which I co-authored with Belinda Weaver from Griffith University. Uh, and if you look at the citation, 2021, really? It was published last year. Uh, let's just ignore why publishers decide <laughs> they're going to do a copyright date of the following year. And um, so we'll just ignore that. The point here is that some of you may recall when Megan Oakleaf, uh, again, the citations there, uh, was uh, contracted, I think, by Association of College and Research Libraries, ACRL, to produce a report on value of academic libraries. This caused quite uh, an enormous stir because basically what she says, it says here, and I can't read it because I've actually got um, pictures of myself on the screen, is the thing she said was, look folks, you think because you're a library that inherently everyone knows how great you are and the value you're bringing to the institution. But guess what? Senior management, your institutions don't necessarily understand why, what the value is, what the value proposition is. Uh, generally, because as studies have shown, libraries would report uh, on some of those metrics, which uh, look great. Gosh, we have an increase of 20% or 25% of the number of engineering students who came to a training session. Uh, isn't that great? And a senior administrator goes, so why is that important? Because the senior administrator is asking him or herself or themselves, what is the value to the university? How does that influence uh, either student retention or student success. That's the way, you know, in terms of dollars and cents and prestige and the rest. And libraries simply didn't get it. So Megan Oakley helped, helped them understand <laughs> that libraries actually, university libraries actually had to market themselves. But the point I'm bringing out here also as a corollary to that is that ever since, and it's 10 years later, libraries are still re-examining their support uh, services to uh, researchers and or to their to their community and to to students and while uh, universities I mean I've listed one of these uh, important uh, concerns for universities as being uh, the ranking schemes, you know, the famous global ranking schemes, they care uh, ab about, even though they don't really, in many cases, want it to drive necessarily all the courses they're offering and, and how they run their university, but it's prestige. Where does a university rank in some major global university ranking scheme? And so universities, care about how their researchers are not only doing research, is the research having an impact, and therefore it's noted here, 
but of course, as a corollary, um, they also care about how researchers are supported um, and uh, in, in, in doing research. And so libraries realized that there was a connection. They need to look at that. And if you think in pa of Pakistan specifically, I mean, you have the, your HEC, which uh, publishes its ranking of higher education, Pakistani higher education institutions. Although when I looked the other day, I think I'm not sure it's gone past 2015. And Pakistani institutions are represented in major uh, ranking schemas such as uh, QS, the Coralie Sons uh, University Rankings Asia, which is a subset of the world rankings. So yes, these things matter. And so universities do care about how uh, researchers are, are being supported and that's a major context. So internet worldwide or internationally, uh, libraries are actually having to demonstrate to their say, research office or a, um, a pro vice chancellor of research or whatever the title might be, the value that they're adding so that the university can attain its strategic goals that it may have in terms of a research impact. So what are, and these won't be, uh, uh, these will be familiar to most of you just so we won't spend much time on these, but importantly, what are the drivers uh, and why the focus on research? Well, we have global competitiveness. It's not just for research funding. There's global competitiveness competitiveness among universities for staff and for students. Um, and uh, you'll see universities worldwide market themselves on uh, how, why doing research at that university uh, might be of interest to, particularly to students or why a uh, top researcher might want to uh, come and work there. There's a significant increase in information available for research use. Uh, of course, one of the ones there, we know research funding bodies, uh, whether it's national or, or private, uh, want to see a better return on their investment. They want to make sure that their dollars are in, in spent in research are actually producing results. Uh, that's, of course, a whole nother topic, which we won't go into today because it begs the question about how long before you see impact on any research. There's a shift in, per in perceptions, I think we were looking at this before, that um, research is more than just publications. This is highly important. There's a shift to better managing the ever-increasing volume of research data and to view data as, I quote, a first-class out of research. And I want to come back to that because this is something that is very much driving not only research, but also very importantly supporting research. Uh, and of course, the rapid development of technologies used in research. And one of those happens to be research tools. Now, um, I mentioned uh, in my introduction, the slides when we finally got to it with the surfer on the beach. You have to do that in Australia because we have a Gold campus at the Gold Coast, so that's doing good. I mentioned research framework in my introduction for two reasons. Uh, one is that research is conducted as uh, a planned project. It has key stages. And uh, this is an example here, we'll get to in a minute. And also because, <clears throat> not just because I'm a structuralist, and I like frameworks because I think frameworks at least give us a kind of starting point where we can, at a very high level, look at important concepts that underpin, uh, it might be a process, it might be a concept, whatever that is. And uh, when you look at my list of publications, the word framework has often, often appeared as a topic. But an, the other important reason for talking about um, research frameworks is a number of years ago, um, university libraries began to examine how the services they were offering fit into what became the so-called research life cycle. And this was how it was referred to. And there are, if you go and Google, 
under images research lifecycle, you will see many, many, many uh, different uh, uh, depictions of how that, that plays out. Um, and then even more importantly, not just libraries didn't just look at how what their current offerings would complement the so-called research life cycle. They then went further and they explored whether or even where they could offer additional services that would help provide um, opportunities to, to better support researchers. Now, if you're a researcher, and if you are here, you don't necessarily look at uh, how you conduct research in this way, of course. Uh, this is just a, a way of trying to show some of these synergies and it is life cycle because it's cyclical. It is not, a, as we know, anyone doing research is not a linear process, but there are certain key stages. I'm showing you this interactive diagram. Oh, it's actually interactive in PDF. I think nowadays, to be honest, people would use some other tool like HTML. I actually wanted to introduce this at Griffith, but somehow we, we never got there. I just, I just loved it because um, what I, it's from um, at the University of Central uh, Florida, never heard of it, but I certainly love what they've done here. It allows researchers, if you're looking at various tasks, you see planning cycle, because you have to plan, uh, you might need to look at planning how to get a grant or what's the research concept. I mean, I don't have to tell you what all the bits and pieces are um, and you do them when you're conducting research in, in, in uh, not necessarily in that order, but there are the certain stages within those. Um, so what the interactive diagram, and they still have this, because I went and checked their website yesterday. You click on a task, which is one of the, uh, it might say, for example, uh, if you need assistance, you're a researcher and you need assistance, it might be for applying for a grant, which is over here. Uh, on the right side under project cycle, or it might be something like uh, managing your data. And then because it's interactive, it's these uh, little circles, colored circles are actually clickable links that then take you to more information. Now, I think what's really interesting about this approach and what I liked about it and and I'm not sure even that it was quite the sophisticated when I probably saw it oh, seven years ago initially, is the approach taken, I think, by this particular university epitomizes a critical aspect of supporting researchers. And that is that while the library, well, it's called libraries, but we're, while the library at this particular university created this tool, they do not offer all of the support services with the different colors on the chart. However, the important role that the library is offering here is to connect researchers with other areas, a point that Dr. Agarwal made, other areas within the university who can offer assistance. So although it's not easy to see, I mean, you'd actually probably have to go to the site. There's a legend at the bottom, and, and for example, green is, is there re, uh, there's a research office. You might need to go and ask for about information for grants. So the assumption is that the, not that the library can necessarily provide expertise on all aspects of the research life cycle, but what it can do is connect researchers to resources, resources being part of this, as Dr. Arwa was talking about, knowledge management. This is kind of quite a simplistic uh, interpretation in that way, but I kind of see it as tying into what you were talking about. Uh, and uh, as I say, researchers wouldn't necessarily look at uh, how they do research quite, quite this way. They have a different way that they have to work, but it is helpful in terms of providing a kind of structure and helpful for libraries. Um, in a previous, uh, sorry, in a previous slide, uh, we, I mentioned the, the perception now that data is a first class output of research. The corollary to that is it's also an input for new research. But if you're a scholar, um, 
I think the uh, statement here, data is the new gold, should probably resonate. It doesn't matter which discipline you're in, whether you're in one of the STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, medicine, or a discipline in the humanities or social sciences. <clears throat> However, on the other hand, I suspect that some librarians may have gone, ah, cringed at that four letter word, data. <laughs> hopefully not. And actually, hopefully, uh, in thinking about Dr. Agarwal's uh, presentation, he's actually provided, I think, some, some interesting approaches as to how you might handle uh, uh, data if it were, in fact, a challenge for you. But we hope not. Of course, we have the famous data tsunami. <laughs> Can't talk about data without the data tsunami. Not surprisingly, given the importance of data, uh, it has its own life cycle. And this is just one variant. This is from JISC. Uh, many people in library and information science would be familiar with the uh, great work done by JISC in the UK in supporting aspects of scholarly communication. And as with the higher level research life cycle, libraries, again, are exploring how they can support these particular activities or tasks or stages uh, that are not, as you say, none of this is linear, of course. Mm. Excuse me. Research tools. Um, an important part of research, which, uh, I mean, data tends to get a more currently, a lot of the publicity, a lot of the headlines for a whole number of reasons we've been looking at. But important part of research, which is often not properly considered, is the use of research tools, uh, which underpin so many projects. And I, again, I have to thank Malcolm Walski for bringing this to, uh, I know, my attention and to other people within, particularly Griffith and elsewhere. Uh, there are many definitions about what research tools are. We particularly like this one from Canada, if you ignore social science and humanities, because I mean, that was that council. But if you look at <clears throat> what it is that tools enable researchers to do and how they can be created in house or they can be purchased off the shelf, this is an interesting and an um, interesting challenge uh, for researchers and librarians in, in terms of supporting. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the research done by um, Bianca Kramer and your, uh, Johan Bosman in 2016. Very interesting. Uh, I think they're in the Netherlands. Malcolm and I did uh, communicate with them. They're absolutely wonderful. And uh, what their project did, I think they had something like 26 thousand replies to a survey they ran. It's just phenomenal, I think, of which over a thousand, I think, were librarians, but don't quote me, just go and look at it. What it highlighted along uh, another aspect along with data, which prevents, as I say, uh, presents some interesting challenges for both uh, researchers and support staff, because, of course, if nothing else, and I don't expect anyone to, to memorize this, but what it shows, uh, 2015, it turns out, is, is a bit of an anomaly because they, they stopped getting the surveys in 2015. So you ignore 2015. But what it starts to show is the absolute increase in tools used by researchers. Uh, it's phenomenal when you, when you look at the increase. Of course, some of the tools are, like Word is a tool, and then you get something like MATLAB or or, or uh, highly, highly sophisticated tools. And their research did show that on average, whatever average means, a uh, researcher would use on average 22 tools to do their research, which is kind of interesting when you're thinking about uh, supporting that. While a university has a very complex role in supporting and the acquisition, the implementation, and the ongoing support for digital tools, uh, librarians 
and we have library researcher collaboration over here, can play an important role too. And we're just going to have a look at how that plays out on the next slide. So what I've done here, we've been talking about uh, the importance of research, the importance of research tools, uh, uh, data, and, and uh, libraries looking at how they can modify, enhance traditional services, offer new services to support this ever-growing emphasis on research. So what I um, did in this particular slide is I picked out examples of research support services, which universities, um, libraries worldwide are now offering. Uh, this is not inclusive, of course. It was just to capture um, um, examples. And I just mentioned research tools and here we are. So you have databases and I think Dr. Arbolo was talking about databases, but you have computer programs. I might need to use uh, advanced features of spreadsheeting, Excel. And then you have analytical tools such as R. You have, um, well, referencing tools, of course, but highly sophisticated uh, analytical tools. I'm aware uh, uh, some of you may have heard of the so-called hacky hours that are run internationally uh, in which uh, uh, various support research support staff within a university gather with researchers that could include, uh, well, scholars and because graduate students, researchers, academics, people doing research to help them with a technical problem. And I know at Griffith, um, before I um, retired, there were actually librarians involved in training uh, researchers in R. Okay, so it's, 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 that's quite interesting. Uh, relevant data sources, not just particularly traditional ones. We have organizations, an NGO, for anyone who's not familiar with the term, is a um, non government organization, a wide uh, variety, of course. Is that particularly new? No, but it is about finding sources in data as opposed to perhaps uh, publications. Research methods, uh, um, because um, sometimes in uh, tackling a, a research concept, uh, a researcher may not yet have worked out what might be the most appropriate methodology. Uh, then we have training, um, what training is available internally and externally for them. Uh, and support services, which again goes back to something. Well, I'll come and touch on that at the end. So that the library in a sense connects either directly or indirectly nowadays in many institutions uh, with other support services, uh, research support services. So there is a, that's a kind of knowledge base, if you will, uh, of whom do I uh, send someone to for additional expertise? So the impact on university libraries of the increased importance on research and on having to demonstrate that uh, how libraries are supporting researchers that may or not may may or may not resonate uh, with this audience. I'm not sure. But certainly there are uh, studies and um, <clears throat> so forth that have um, discussed uh, ways in which libraries have to report back to um, the parent organization on what kind of activities they're doing and how that actually benefits strategically whatever the university's goals are around research. Obviously universities have goals around learning and teaching too, of course, but specifically research. So this list is, I'm not, I wasn't trying to imply that university libraries somehow own these services, I'll have a quick look at these. What it is intended to show that libraries uh, may have expertise which they can contribute and sometimes it goes back to what Dr. Arloa was saying. Do we know, oh, do we know ex what some of our library staff have expertise in? 
I mean, they do a job, whatever that is, um, but they may actually have knowledge or expertise in some other area that we just haven't thought about. Uh, developing common data structures, uh, metadata, well, libraries and cataloging, metadata for data integration. Libraries already do this. They have to map data from, it might be from uh, uh, within a library system across to uh, summons or, or, or one of those services. So they're well and truly familiar with that. Uh, I'll skip number two for the moment. Uh, legal frameworks. Think about librarians who have to have an understanding of licensing and IP and so forth, who are supporting your in institutional repositories. Copyright. Uh, tool development. There are uh, librarians, as I said, who come in who have other discipline knowledge. They may come in with a previous background. They may have come to librarianship or library information science uh, from some other a discipline. It may be uh, I'm familiar with, biology. It may be uh, computer science. It may be uh, chemistry, whatever. And it's interesting because I have watched this in different universities where people, where the library has utilized those skills to help enhanced delivery of services. Archiving and preservation, many of libraries already, already offer these. Particularly, I think uh, number two is particularly pertinent. This is the one, participation in cross-disciplinary and possibly multi-institutional teams to which libraries, librarians bring their skills. You're not doing all of the research support. They're part of a team and they're contributing uh, their skills. The, uh, and I, we have only to look at examples, I think from the US, a classic one is Purdue, which uh, uh, described, I don't know, probably 10 years ago now, how they were already introducing, uh, that they were creating um, uh, multi, across disciplinary teams uh, to um, support uh, their institutional repository. We have um, New Zealand with the University of Otago. There's the UK, there's Germany, Australia, um, Griffith. And in an article published in um, 2020, really in 2020, um, uh, by, um, again, Malcolm Wolski, myself, and Michelle Craw, from, who was a researcher, that was very interesting working with an actual uh, post-doctoral um, researcher from health sciences we actually documented some of the very interesting cases that exist around the world of having cross-disciplinary teams where in a research project team, a librarian is one of many bringing their own skills, not just the researchers alone. Multi-institutional, um, this again tends to depend on countries, but I think of Australia, this is very prevalent in Australia, also in Europe with the European Commission. Um, yeah, and examples from the United States where you actually have um, universities or researchers from various universities come together to create, uh, to put a, a funding proposal. And so what you do is you actually have researchers from those different universities collaborating on a project and behind them are support staff. So you get multi-institutional teams. Uh, there was a wonderful, a wonderful example in the South Pacific uh, in recent years working on climate adaptation where a whole number of universities came together and among those were, uh, and those teams were librarians. They bring skills uh, in terms, well, we talk about things such as data structures, metadata format, understanding how to, uh, 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 knowledge management or information management, I should say. Uh, so I think fundamental uh, to the design of uh, some of the new systems which address needs, and I'm looking particularly at point four, which is the new support service tools and processes. Uh, there's been an import, there currently is input from information professionals with specialist, special skills. Of course, librarians among them. 
in fact, uh, back in 2013, and I can never, uh, the first name is Polish, and uh, I may have a background in languages, but Polish isn't one of the languages I speak. So this was a report done, I think, for, it may have been uh, Australian College and Research Libraries, as I recall. It was a standalone report. It seemed to take forever. It's Jagoszewski and Williams in 2013. They argued that what they called li liaison librarians, which would be faculty librarians or academic librarians or uh, discipline librarians, however you want to call them, not research support specialists, that those librarians not only have a role as advocates, but also as consultants. What they meant was they had a role in, and I quote, identify faculty needs and then make referrals to colleagues with more specialized, often technical expertise. And again, that goes to a point that Dr. Agarwal was making at the end, um, that we not everyone has all the knowledge, or if you look again at that uh, research life cycle uh, as depicted from um, Central Florida University, uh, it shows a whole range of stakeholders within the university who provide support services. So if librarians can identify, first you have to identify the faculty need and then actually make the referral, not go, oh, I don't have the answer to that and move on. But then in fact, you own, you own that, uh, um, that need and then follow up to, it's, 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 I guess it's a kind of inculcating a certain culture about service. And in her seminal report in 2012 to um, Research Libraries UK, Auckland discusses what she called a more proactive uh, model of engagement with researchers. Again, Dr. Argo was, was giving actual uh, concrete examples. And I think a major uh, driver for the creation of, and it says librarian support roles, of new, uh, uh, um, roles in, in libraries in terms of supporting research. And I haven't, I didn't bother to try to come up with a whole list. You can find them on the internet, a whole list of, because they change all the time and depends on the institution, how they, how they label them. But the creation for these new roles, which are more, new roles, which are more aligned with the requirements of researchers. One of the major drivers is researchers may simply avoid traditional, uh, bypass traditional, what they consider to be traditional library support because they don't see the relevance. And they use instead a whole variety of alternative models for support. Um, but of course, that's another topic for another day on how to actually market your library services to your target or intended, intended audience. So these are uh, some of the uh, roles that librarians now have that they didn't have uh, in the more traditional setting. And of course, number two is, is extremely important. So I have no idea how I'm going on time because I don't have a clock here. I think in the key messages, uh, <laughs> flexible, this is both from the perspective of the, of the researchers, obviously, and librarians. I mean, if I think uh, not having those qualities probably means it's not going to be a fun time. So um, in terms of engaging with uh, uh, either research itself, undertaking research, if you might be a librarian or you might uh, be in, actually in a, in a discipline, another discipline, you need to ask yourself, well, how flexible and adaptive am I? And of course, willing to learn because we brought up the four-letter word data. The establishing the good working relationships. That was kind of the point I was making at the beginning where I was very fortunate through having worked with people such as uh, Linda O'Brien, who's actually the chair of the board of ORCID. That's a topic for another day as to why all authors should have ORCID IDs. Um, stakeholders in um, research support, because if we go back again to that model from Florida, 
what does it try to do? It tries to provide an overview of what is the end-to-end -end support, not that research is linear, how do we provide an end-to-end -end, uh, uh, service for researchers so that all the uh, areas or stages or tasks that, that they might need assistance with is covered and we know who's covering it and we have that knowledge, knowledge um, information. And knowing how and when to make a referral to someone with expertise you don't have is absolutely fundamental because uh, no one staff member, for example, a librarian, is going to have all the answers. And therefore, it's extremely useful uh, appointment in the, by Dr. Agarwal to build a really good network of other people whom you can consult. Now, those people, some of them will be librarians, but hopefully there will be um, staff, people from other areas within the university, in your university, who are uh, stakeholders in supporting research and also from outside the university. If you're a researcher, uh, I had that conversation with a researcher yesterday, we'll go nameless. If you're a researcher and you have a problem and you're not sure how to do something, what do you do? As a researcher, you consult an expert. That might be someone on your research team. If you're part of a team, it might be a colleague or it might be someone external to your university. You generally know whom you should consult to, to get that answer or how to do that. And the same, and I'm not sure librarians uh, necessarily think of this in the same way, that these networks, that you're not there alone. I think this is a really, really key message. I mentioned data as being a four letter word. Why it's scary and oh, I don't know anything about data. No, oh, gosh, it's really, really scary. Well, like anything, it's, you know, if it's new and, uh, but it's not that you have to know everything about it. It's having an understanding of where it fits in terms of the research life cycle. And if there are questions that you can't answer, or a researcher has a need for, whom would you send that researcher to? Or better yet, you make the contact with the person who can provide that support and say, uh, Dr. X in this uh, faculty is having difficulty with can you assist? And hopefully there is that kind of culture. So it's kind of seen as everybody who supports research within a university has a vested interest in providing a, a holistic uh, um, a support service. No one area uh, is deemed to just own a certain part of the whole chain everyone ideally should be aware of what other stakeholders do, or if not, at least they're at the table together talking about how they're, how they're supporting. So in conclusion, um, I, you can read this yourself, but um, clearly universities have a lot, of, a lot of concerns. And in terms of research, most want to increase their research activity. And that's very clear in what the HEC says in pa Pakistan and hopes will happen. And of course, um, naturally, who doesn't want to increase their research impact? But it can't rely just on the output of researchers. It has to also be linked to the quality of the support they're receiving. And I hope that uh, the other message you take away from this today, if there's a message, is that the library really can make a valuable contribution. It's, I think, a, a, a more a question of sitting down and libraries kind of examining what it is they bring to the table. And that is a quite an interesting, um, I would think a brainstorming uh, activity for uh, universities and university libraries, I should say, if they haven't already done this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jonah Richardson for highlighting a very important uh, area, I must say that library should provide research support services in the context of data. They can gather the data, compile it, and then, you, you know, 
uh, can uh, extend their research support services in uh, preserving the data. It's such a uh, well received presentation. So we look forward towards some question answer, answer sessions. I see if we have any question. There is no question in return. If any, everybody. I'm sorry. <laughs> Umar, Umar, Umar uh, Shafiq, Dr. Umar Shafiq raised his hand and he has a question. Just a moment. I'm going to turn the air conditioning on in this room. I'm dying. Oh. Ah, the thunderstorm. <laughs> Thunder. Yeah, yes. No. Umar, you can uh, now speak and ask your question, please. Umar. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear okay, you. Right. Uh, so hello, everybody. Um, thanks, uh, first of all, uh, to the organizers for organizing this uh, webinar and also to the presenters. Um, just a quick background about myself. My name is Dr. Umar Shafiq. Uh, sorry, my laptop had some problem with voice previously. And uh, it's ironic, actually, I was born and I grew up in my parents' house, which is only five kilometers away from Islamia University, Bahawalpur campus on, in Settle Town. And um, I'm, so this is my hometown. And I'm really glad to, to see these ongoing discussions on uh, knowledge management. I want to briefly mention that in, uh, I'm in Carlton University in Ottawa, and uh, we do uh, quite some research on information uh, and knowledge management. And actually, I continue to read uh, many articles from Dr. Naresh Agarwal since we met back in Singapore. And, you know, time flies. It looks like it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. So, um, and thanks also to the great uh, uh, points raised by Dr. Joanna. My question is, in context of knowledge management, and a historical city with a lot of history and heritage. Now, I moved out from city of Bahawalpur many years ago, but every year when I visit Bahawalpur, I notice one thing, that with the passage of time, that uh, rich culture, the heritage that it had, slowly it is, it sometimes I feel like it's fading. And mm -hmm. as being an information science and knowledge management researcher, and data science person, I always think, can't we build some sort of, uh, you know, knowledge platform to try to preserve these things? I know word is changing, word is adopting to new changes, but can't we do something in order to preserve this nice, uh, you know, historical culture and heritage? So my question to uh, Dr. Joanna and also to Dr. Naresh in context of your presentation is that what exactly in your opinion, in your expert opinion, that can be done beyond writing papers, of course, which is important, but like in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, practical development, especially that can, uh, let's say, students at Islamia University Bahawalpur can do in order to preserve this, uh, you know, historical culture and heritage. Thank you. I'll just... Uh, I Dr. Agarwal will probably have a longer uh, uh, response than me. I will point out to a, a concrete example. Again, I'm going to use Australia and I'm going to use Griffith University. It may be that Griffith University was until last year uh, in that category of top 50 year old, you know, young universities when they do one of the subsets of those world ranking systems we don't want to talk about. Uh, and so they were in that younger category. And because it was deemed to be a young university, there on, on the 40th anniversary, I think it's, I can't remember, it's up to 50 now. Um, on the 40th anniversary, uh, and there must've been philanthropy around this, there was kind of a, a, a kind of coming together of, we need to capture this history we need to capture the history because it's new enough that we actually have all the photographs and people are still alive. That's always helpful, uh, the people who are in the photographs. And so what, long story short, they did was establish Griffith archives. 
And its purpose is to do what you've been describing. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna get the, the, are you Dr. Shafiq or are you Dr. Omer? Yeah. Uh, double, <laughs> I'm still not up on all the names. Um, and uh, in terms of, it's digital so, because um, although there are certain artifacts, one of which was found in Canada of all things, um, I think it was the mace that belonged to the original <laughs> uh, vice chancellor. Um, but the, so there are some artifacts, but most of it is digital. And it's, um, but it's taken and they just hired someone, you know, not at a high salary level or high uh, a library and from library information science and actually worked over a number of years to create uh, an, uh, an actual archive. To me, I mean, thinking of the glam sector, you know, libraries, archives, museums, and so forth, um, that that's a very interesting way to go. I mean, it, it is a way of at least preserving part of the history of not losing what you have now. And, and then the filling in the retrospective probably takes longer. But I'm, I'm a big proponent of um, establishing an archive uh, to capture culture. Thank you, Joanna. I think uh, you, you, your answer captured, I think, a big part of what I wanted to talk about in terms of uh, establishing archives, I think. That, that, is, that would be a, a key way. But I think the, the problem goes into this uh, quest for development. I find that uh, in many cities right across the world, people want to get rich and they look at uh, big buildings, steel and glass and wider roads and all of that in terms of development. And the word development I find is a dirty word because it often means destruction. It means in trying to do something new, you first destroy what you have. And by the time you realize what you've destroyed is too late. And, it, and it, it can take like 20, 30 years, 50 years before people realize it. And I find that uh, sadly in a lot of historical cities, like people do not realize what they're doing. And I think it requires various stakeholders to come in in terms of uh, trying to sensitize people in terms of realizing what, what value you already have. And then to bring about development in a way where you preserve what you can to the largest extent possible. And then as you say, in, in, in whatever needs to be, cannot be retained in that manner in order to try to uh, create digital memories in terms of establishing ar archives and, and interviewing people. And uh, also, I think uh, if there are greater stakeholders in terms of if people can market what you have better and saying that all these things are the reasons why, why tourists come to the city, why people come over here, then pe once, mm -hmm. once money, it translates into money, then people will want to preserve it. Yeah. Good point. Good. Um, it's used, uh, uh, Griffith, it would be a, a, a marketing. Uh, look, what we've done is a, a I realize this doesn't hold uh, carry in Pakistan particularly, but look at what we've accomplished for being such a young university. Mm, there we were digging the soil in 1971 or whatever, and here we are now with a uh, five uh, star rated uh, energy building, whatever uh, that is. I like what you've said about, at, about cap at least capturing now what you can. The question is who? The university itself, I'm not sure whether Dr. Omar, Omar Shafiq is necessarily, I, I'm not sure who, they're the stakeholders, which the university goes, well, we're not spending money on an archive. Mm. Uh, but sometimes uh, citizen science, again, I'm not sure about the culture here, so please forgive me. But uh, if that works, uh, citizen science, interested people, a local historical society, would they have an interest in this? You know, you have people who, who are knowledgeable, who are happy to contribute to the public good. Um, are these people that would be interested um, that you could bring together? I mean, I, I'm not sure officially and there'll be legal constraints around that, but I think exploring who might be interested in contributing and maybe again, what's the value proposition back to the university? That could be interesting. And also, I think starting small is important. Like taking a small project and doing it, show demonstrating success. And once people see it working, then a lot more people might join. 
Yes, uh, it, what do they always say about projects? You know, make sure in the first stage that you deliver yeah. agile, <laughs> yeah. agile methodology. <laughs> Don't wait till the end when you've got it all done. Folks, show show progress at the beginning. <laughs> I'm going to work with Daga Awal. I'm sure there's a project we can work on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great points uh, by uh, both the mm -hmm. presenters, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, and it is great to know that you are from Bahawalpur, just a few minutes uh, away from Rishi University. Um, it is for the international speaker that this city, Bahawalpur, is called the city of palaces. And our university library is named on the uh, very prominent Nava. Sir Sadiq Muhammad Khan Library. And we have uh, taken many steps uh, in collaboration with the local government for the beautification of and the preservation of uh, the traditional uh, 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 heritage of this uh, city. Like you are saying that uh, the traditional culture is fading, but we are trying our level best to uh, preserve it, rather promote it. You. Uh, uh, our, uh, we have a uh, board that is called Kila uh, Dirava. And uh, the government, local government, and even at Punjab government level, uh, they have taken many steps. They have uh, started to organize a Jeep uh, uh, since many years. So we, ha we are having many participants, even from different uh, um, other countries and other provinces of this uh, uh, country. And they participate in this Jeep Rally, Desert Jeep Rally. And this is very much um, uh, popular among the participants. So as long as we have said that the other traditional culture is being, should be preserved, that uh, we have preserved, there are seven gates. There you, you are aware of that. Many, many gates, Multani gate, Bikaneri gate, Shikarpuri gates. So we have also, uh, that was uh, obviously that getting damaged, so we have also uh, done that, and uh, I was talking to the other day, uh, day the, the principal of Fine Arts College, and uh, they have taken many steps uh, for the beautification, like the uh, traditional culture of Bahawalpur, traditional, um, uh, you know, this is uh, desert, so what is the culture of desert, what kind of dress do they wear, what kind of jewelry do they wear, so that is all um, uh, they are trying to preserve it. And luckily, I have got a uh, uh, chief librarian who is my PhD student of the public library in Bahawalpur. That was also established by the Nawab of Bahawalpur. And we were talking about the same thing about how to preserve the uh, traditional culture of uh, Bahawalpur and South Punjab. Like this city uh, um, wasn't the same like my dad has seen uh, those gates. Uh, and obviously, after some years, um, because we are going to go for the modernization and uh, of our city and uh, culture here. So things are not going to be the same as my dad have seen or I have seen and after 50 years or so my children or grandchildren are going to see. Uh, so we are trying to archive and digitize. Um, we have got uh, rich culture, uh, uh, literature available. Even we have worked uh, in collaboration with UNESCO and uh, we have published uh, many uh, literature, valuable information is given there. So, and we are in process of that. That's great. wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ravina. So these are great efforts by you. I highly appreciate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have just last question from our international participant from Nigeria. Uh, he wants to know, his question is, this looks like a lot to digest at a time. Is there a starting point in getting involved in the research life cycle for a librarian, especially to build recognition and relevance with researcher? This is important for me as research support is not really popular in my country in Nigeria. The question is to uh, Dr. Jonah. Thank you. <laughs> I think I just got asked the meaning of life here. Um, I'm, that's quite a challenge. I, I think rather than just talk off the top of my head to that, 
I wouldn't mind being able to respond to this person perhaps through email, I would be happy so that I might give some thought uh, to what some possible avenues might be. Would that, would that be all right? That, that would be perfectly all right. I, I think so, because there's an environment, there's, there are, I, I am aware of Nigeria because I've uh, certainly reviewed a lot of uh, manuscripts from uh, Nigerian universities. <laughs> uh, and I, I say that with all due respect. So I know there's work being done there. However, I, there are some questions I would like to ask of that person first, rather than just going, I think you should do this. Yeah, you know, I, I don't. And, and I would just want to add that maybe just meet with the faculty members or researchers first as a librarian and try to come up with some common, uh, common ground, I think, in terms of I, areas to work yes. together. I, I'm interested to know though what resources uh, the confidence the person has, what skills they think they bring. Uh, I mean, I think there's an interesting conversation that, that could be had, which uh, that's from my background as teaching. <laughs> yeah. uh, so this is not in any way to minimize the importance. That is a critical question. Yeah. Why would uh, uh, people don't want to start? It, it's, an it's an actual key question. It encapsulates a key question, which is, uh, which is, uh, the elephant in the room in many libraries, where do I start? If there's no top down perspective, which is what I'm hearing here, that's the challenge. If within a library and their strategic goals and their operational plan and strategic plan, where does research fit? Because normally you would adhere to the strategic goals of a university and that drives the services this is not a lecture in library management, folks, <laughs> but I am talking from experience and from having to deliver on this topic and to actually action this. Uh, and so if all of those are missing, then that's a kind of, that's a real challenge for someone who wants to do something and goes, I don't have the support structure behind me. Where do I start? Not an easy question. I'm happy for that person to email me uh, on my Gmail account. Uh, and oh. um, have, have a conversation with them. All right, so I will uh, connect that person to you through email. So, uh, yeah, we should move, yeah. Yes, yes. sorry. Uh, 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 thank may the school, uh, may the school. <laughs> thank you, uh, Dr. Jonah Richardson for your presentation and uh, insightful thoughts for working uh, ideas which you have shared to us on data, data in terms of research for services at university libraries. So I move forward to our third distinguished uh, guest speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Hizes Law. Uh, I would like to introduce Professor Dr. Hizes Law uh, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Hizes uh, received his MA in 1977 in Library Science from University of Denver and his PhD in 1988 in Information Studies from University of Sheffield, England. Professor Hizes is an author of more than 200 papers and articles, 20 monograms, including IFLA Information Literacy Guideline an author, researcher of UNESCO MLI Global Assessment Framework, among other UNESCO publications. His research focuses on information literacy and the development of information competencies. Mm -hmm. Professor Lu is a recipient of numerous awards, such as BRLA Librarian of the Year, US Award, and FIL Guada La Laura Librarian of the Year, IFLA model, the SLA John Cotton. He has facilitated nearly 150 courses, including workshop and seminar on librarian information science with special emphasis on information literacy and management leadership at several institutions of Botswana, Brazil, Colombia, Estonia, Guatemala, Mexico, Peru, USA, Venezuela, among others. Thank you, Professor uh, Hizes Law, for joining us and waiting for so long. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Hizes, if you 
Uh, yes, yes, we can hear you now. Thank you for the introduction. Let me share that my PowerPoint. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to take part in this webinar. <coughs> Professor Dr. Rubina Bati, and for the introduction of uh, that I had from Professor Salman Bin Naim. I'm sorry if I don't pronounce well your, your last names. Well, Pakistan is such a far away country from Mexico. Uh, we don't hear that much about Pakistan. However, in a way, I have been familiar with uh, Pakistan because I did my PhD in England, where there are there is a good, you know, sizable Pakistani population. So I had some classmates from Pakistan, and and I enjoy your your food a lot. And be, uh, besides giving this, these things. I would like to say that, you know, as like my colleague, Narish Agarwal, I'm in the Western world right now. So it's gonna be two o'clock in the morning. I have been joining and sort of covering my face. And even though I took a cup of coffee, I have been a bit sleepy, but I kept awake with the, the interesting presentations done by my two uh, predecessors, you know, the, Joanna and, and Narish. I think I learned uh, a lot uh, this evening. Okay, my goal tonight is to share with you the importance and uh, role that libraries have to, uh, to develop information skills in students and sometimes among faculty. And I have a, an, uh, an, ex, an analogy that I would like to use. I don't know if you have this type of bread here in Mexico it's called biscuit, you know, like cookie in English terms. In fact, it's a piece of bread. You normally toast it and put some butter or, and jelly. So it's a nice piece of bread to have for breakfast or, you know, for high tea. Anyhow, this piece of bread, the quality, the flavor of it depends on the quality of the ingredients. So what Keep in mind this piece of bread because I'm gonna use it for the beginning of the presentation, okay? Let me move. Here are the topics that I'm planning to, to, to cover in, 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 in the short time that I have. I think it's about 25 minutes. If, if one is to talk a little bit about information culture, will be a, a brief mention. I, and I will talk about the process of creating information literacy learning handbook and how this can support faculty. And I will describe the exercises. The last point is probably the one that will take more, more time. So unlike the two previous presentations, mine is a pragmatic one, you know, one action that libraries can develop, can do to support the faculty. Faculty are key actors in the learning process. They are key actors in the research processes of universities. And they are in charge of developing these skills among the students in the different courses or labs, wherever they, 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 they teach. So the knowledge that I, that I use is, I compare the university with a bakery where, where faculty, you know, professors uh, or even staff are the bakers but libraries provide the ingredients. And libraries are in charge of providing, you know, the flour that is the key ingredient to have a good uh, research output. I think Professor Narish Agarwal described quite well the importance of uh, using, you know, quality information. So if we have a, a bakery, we certainly need to have a good a good uh, flower provider, and this is the library. The library can play this role. Let me move to the next slide. So learning is like, you know, learning to, to make bread. So libraries 
can enable faculty to, to foster, you know, in the proper way, information skills or media skills among their students. A, the university that I work for is called Universidad Veracruzana. The Universidad Veracruzana is in the southeastern part of Mexico. I don't know if Joanna knows this part. It's somewhere on the Gulf of Mexico. A, it's a tropical climate, so it's hot most during the most, uh, most of the months of the year. And the, the, uh, at this university, we develop uh, an information literacy course that it is eight, eight, eight credits. And this course has been going on for about 10 years now and the different versions of, of it. So however, bes well, besides doing this course uh, in, assessing the impact in the learning processes of the university. We have learned that in order to really equip students with information skills, we need to have, you know, the rest of the faculty uh, supporting or developing information skills. In other words, we need these metrics, uh, this curricula to work towards the development of these skills. In a country like mine where research is not, uh, you know, as strong as it is in Australia or as it is in, you know, in the U.S. It, so our universities tend to focus more, more on teaching rather than, you know, uh, giving the, the the proper weight to to, to research. So this uh, this university, Universidad de Veracruzana, along with a, a Northern University in Baja California, which is on the Pacific side. Uh, develop uh, an exercise handbook uh, for information literacy skills. These exercises are based on the Mexican information literacy standards that uh, now are kind of out of use because of, you know, of the frameworks that are being used for, for media and information literacy. But these standards are a good uh, a guide to develop this kind of uh, exercises. The, the handbook is same for Spanish speaking faculty uh, because the resources, some of the resources that we use or that we recommend in, in the exercises, you know, are based on, 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 on this language uh, uh, databases or information resources. However, I will say that 75% of the exercises have to do with international information uh, sources. Uh, the, the handbook, uh, I think, if used properly, it can be, you know, an asset, a, a tool for faculty to, to, to develop these skills during their courses. Uh, I already mentioned uh, Universidad Veracruzana and said this, you know, as doing this, this uh, joint work. Uh, this, these universities uh, uh, are using this manual to train faculty especially the, the new, new, new higher faculty on how they, they could incorporate in their courses information uh, literacy exercises. So the, the handbook is, is, is a part of a three uh, uh, publications, one on how to use APA and the other one on how to write you know, papers or written uh, essays. The, the actual structure of the handbook includes 70 exercises. Here I'm just showing you 60 of them, but the last version that has been submitted to the publisher will include uh, 70 uh, exercises. Uh, each of the learning exercises is neutral. It can be used in chemistry, library science, or physics, or history. Uh, and as you may guess, for those who are in the library field, it covers you know, the basic uh, core elements of searching, information evaluation, how to use information, and how to communicate information. Uh, some exercises are expected to be included in a new edition that we, we plan to, to work, especially on, on it to include more on information evaluation. 
here are the, the exercises that I'm going to show you. Uh, they are grouped according to each of the of the standards, information literacy standards. The exercises are, are have a simple structure, so that faculty can use uh, can adopt them, adapt them, or just use them as a model or get an inspiration to to create their own exercises to foster uh, media and information skills among their students. And you know, information skills are an important step in order to develop research skills. So if a university is going to support research uh, information services, they really need to work on information skills uh, among their, their, their learning community. The elements of, of the exercise are divided in two parts. One, it just includes the title and the type of competence that it tried to, to, to develop. The second one includes the learning objective, the instructions, and an example how to complete the learning task. The first set is uh, it's related to understanding the structure of knowledge and information. Uh, the number of exercises is smaller than, for example, the, the component, the information evaluation component. Here you can see the title of the exercises. Uh, for example, the number one, information and knowledge, the relation and differences. Uh, the second about the different types of publications and, and guides the students on how to, to learn, you know, the different types of them. The importance of, of having, you know, more than one author, uh, the difference between knowledge, scientific knowledge and popular wisdom in the information cycle. The second uh, competence is how to specify an information need. And this includes for uh, uh, exercises like how to select a research topic. And I think Professor Agarwal mentioned, you know, the, 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 the steps that need to be taken to do, uh, to select a good research uh, problem. Uh, how to uh, delimit a, a research topic, how to identify keywords, and how to create a, a search timetable or even a research a, a chronogram. The third competence uh, has to do with effective information search strategies, and it includes this type of exercises. Uh, what, you know, uh, to guide the students to identify the difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary sources, as well as the most commonly used information sources. And this can be adapted to, 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 to the different countries, if it is in, in Chile or Argentina or, or Mexico. Uh, the Twitter as an information source and the importance of using up-to-date information and how you know, the obsolescence uh, of, of of information, like a medicine, you know, it it it, it uh, can be, it can affect the quality of your research if you're using, you know, an, an old uh, source. A, a library visit to identify, you know, the 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 different services the libraries may provide in in a university. The next. Uh, the next exercises have to do with uh, how to use the uh, online public catalog or the library, open door, uh, uh, using uh, social networks as an information source, uh, how to use patents. For example, the example is how to find expired patents. If someone wants to develop a new idea, so he can use you know a previous uh, knowledge uh, on the subject. Uh, academic publications, how to identify them. And the competence four has to do with information retrieval. And here, how to identify relevant libraries in, in, in a country or in a region or in a city. Uh, research centers, how to identify research centers and professional associations related to, 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 to the student's uh, topic or theme that he, may, he or she may be working. Uh, journal repositories, and there are some good ones in, in, in the Spanish speaking world, as well, you know, the international ones that have already mentioned 
in the previous talks. How to do an advanced search on the internet using government sources, uh, TED Talks as, a, as, a, as a, an information tool. And, and, and you know, the list goes on. For example, how to use expert interview, uh, information retrieval at uh, a virtual libraries of the, of the local university, finding a book, ebook, comparing virtual libraries. Uh, also how to identify uh, mobile applications for information retrieval, uh, government statistics, uh, the use of thesis. So it guides, you know, uh, the thesis repositories that are at national and international level, how to use WorldCat, Boolean operators, and so on. Competence five, and there are eight, so we're number five right now. How to analyze and evaluate information. The exercises that were included are how to identify main text ideas, a text highlighting and how to summarize information, a abstract and conceptual maps, assessing the content of mass media, and how to update information sources. Other exercises are uh, identifying the legal information, you know, the framework of the topic, uh, evaluating MOOCs that can be a source of information to get, you know, a training in research or the topic that we're interested in to write an essay, for example. Uh, information search, uh, search in Cielo. Cielo is a, one of the two major journal repositories in the Ibero-American world. How to identify it as a, you know, a good presentation on the subject using a slide share. In competence six, how to integrate the information, how to synthesize it to, to include it in, in, your, in your research or your paper. Here is a, how to create an infographic, how to do brainstorming, how to incorporate your ideas into a first draft. Other exercises, and we are near near the end. Don't get don't get too tired because the terminology, how to write a paper paper according to the audience that we're addressing the paper or the the text that we're drafting. Uh, the review of bibliographic uh, APA styles, how to paraphrase using a, a blog tool. And competence seven is how to communicate your research and information results. Here, uh, the exercises focus on integrating the ideas, you know, to do a final draft, uh, to get acquainted with inter intellectual property and information ethics. Uh, another one is on how to organize uh, his or her ideas, the type of text to present res research results, and how to create a digital newspaper. Combat is eight, which is the, the last one, is, is devoted to ethics of information. Here, uh, there is an exercise to identif identify the bibliographic reference elements so they can use you know, any uh, style that they may need to use in the future. The type of citations, understanding creative commons, and how to ser searching for images and giving a good ethical use. Finally, uh, there is a, an article to review references in bibliography on how to do, you know, the best way to do it. And another exercise on how to use Sotero, Mendeley, and other uh, reference uh, tools. Finally, there is one devoted specifically to, to APA using Sotero, which is a common uh, uh, program uh, used in, 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 at least in Latin America, well, in Spanish speaking countries. So these are the, the 60 elements of the first draft. The second uh, draft, the one that we submitted to the publisher, includes exercises on how to publish. And the exercise that we give, uh, we provide in the handbook uh, are based on Wikipedia. So on how to, to, how to, to, to get a, a paper, you know, in Wikipedia call, call the entries, call them articles. So how a student can do an article to, to, to publish and edit in, in Wikipedia. 
So conclusions. <clears throat> we believe, well, uh, my co-author and myself, that this manual uh, helps a faculty, especially junior ones, uh, on the hard work of creating you know, information skills among the students, especially during the first years of college. The handbook uh, certainly introduced uh, them to, to these learning strategies. This, this is just a, 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 a bunch of them, but faculty can create their own according to the discipline or to the, or to the task that they may be trying to, to teach uh, to their students. It, also, it, it can also be a tool for librarians who conduct information literacy uh, tasks. And this manual can certainly be expanded if, if uh, you know, according to uh, librarian needs. We are hoping to, to, to get it translated into other languages, uh, especially in countries that have less information development. So that, uh, and in order to do that, we are planning to have a, a web version of the manual beside the printed one that is coming out in the, in the next few months. So I think that if we want to, to bake a good piece of bread, we certainly have to provide the skills to students so they can select the quality flour. It can be wheat, it can be maize, it can be any type of grain, but they not have to have you know, the competences to really search for the quality information uh, that will enhance and will enable them to, uh, to contribute with a good paper, a good research output. So this is my presentation. It's, it was 20 minutes according to, to I was instructed. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Professor Lau. Okay, I'm Thank gonna you. take the, the presentation off, okay. Yes, we should go for question and answer session. Uh, if any participant have any question uh, from Professor Hizzer, he may ask. Uh, I just had one, one comment, uh, Professor Lau. I thought it was very interesting in the work that you have done. You have tried to make it very easy for a lot of people to structure the entire research process in a set of competencies and uh, questions and exercises. I was thinking that uh, uh, my idea of information literacy was a more limited term in terms of finding information and digital literacy and, and the consuming information. And I think you have incorporated the entire research process in this. So I would rather call it the research cycle competency or something like that where you can find a, a wider audience as well. I mean, you could market it in both the ways as information literacy, but also the research process handbook or something, a practical okay. research process. I'll take into account your, your, your suggestion and evaluate it with my co-author. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Professor. And uh, I've also uh, have a question, Professor. Is this actually I conducted my uh, uh, funded uh, research and news literacy skill here in Pakistan during pandemic and in the age of infodemic. So what I have observed that information literacy framework is good to provide a sound theoretical conceptual framework to continue a research and news literacy. But when it comes to news literacy instruction, we don't have any instructions so far. And uh, information literacy instruction doesn't fit into the framework of news literacy instruction during the infodemic. And, uh, you know, uh, your ML, MIL framework is, 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 is very near to that news literacy framework, but it also doesn't fit into that. What do you suggest? How could we uh, enhance or uh, uh, further extend the work on uh, information literacy toward news literacy instructions? Well, uh, I don't know if I'm, it was mentioned or not. I'm the co-chair of the Media and Information Literacy Alliance. It's a UNESCO network that includes about 500 organizations all over the world. And I would, I would recognize, you know, that the, the handbook is, is information literacy bias. You know, it's oriented towards information literacy. 
because information literacy has more weight, you know, a higher education than media. But media, uh, I, I, I have to say that is is a very important skill to, to, media literacy is a very important competence to have because it influences our uh, daily decision making, what we eat, what we dress, how we vote, and so on. And news literacy certainly requires a, a specific, you know, a specific exercises. And unfortunately, the manual doesn't cover th this part. But I agree with you that it, it's a very important uh, component that need to be uh, addressed. Hopefully. Especially, you know, being chair of Media and Information Literacy Alliance at UNESCO. Obviously, but it can Obviously. be a work to be taken later on. Yes, there's need because in the post-truth era, we need a news literacy instruction as well. So I hope you look at it. And uh, I was thinking that there's a question by Amir Mahmood, which is how to make innovative research in social sciences. And your, this current discussion answers that question. Because in order to come up with innovative research, you need to find out a problem which, is, which exists. And Dr. Salman, your question is saying that there isn't anything for teaching uh, uh, news literacy or media literacy, right, as a curriculum map or something, whichever way you're framing it. That, that means that you've identified some gap and that's where, that's where room for innovation comes in. Exactly. So in order to find out, come up with innovation, you need to first find out what's out there and then to see what is, what is missing. And that is, that is where you can make a contribution. Thank you, thank you. Do we, uh, another question? Yes, uh, there's a question uh, for Professor Lu. A question is asked by Nuruddin Merchant that keeping in view the lockdown and closure of institutions during pandemic, are you planning to put come up with an online version of it as well? Sorry, I didn't understand the last part of the... We just need to know that are you working on to put an online version of information literacy framework? Yes. Uh, if, if the question related to the handbook, we are planning to have a, a, an online version, you know, to create a website where people can download and even contribute with exercises. And uh, a participant from Nigeria asked the question that will that be available online and it will be open access? Yes, it will be open access. I mean, it will be uh, free uh, to anyone. Wonderful. Wonderful, that would be great actually. You are a wonderful uh, advocate of information literacy. I mean, I have, uh, you know, uh, was following you in my research and I have seen your journey that you came up with the idea of information literacy after coming back to Istanbul to Mexico in 1994. Then you introduced the information literacy framework to library and information schools at Mexico. Yep. That's a great contribution. Thank you. Thank you. I remember I first met Professor Lau in class, saying my uh, conference, I see I will, we see I will. So I met you there. So that day I hear you and that, that was a wonderful uh, thought you shared that day and today as well. And I think you did that, uh, that you are the papers and the library is uh, responsible for providing the right ingredients to the like, uh, university for taking a wonderful break. So our students, our researchers are unpaid for us. So we need to provide good records with the good quality ingredients. Thank you so much. So we, we, have, uh, we have been joined by the worthy Vice Chancellor of the Islamia University of Bahawalpur, Engineer Professor Dr. Atar Mehboot. So we welcome you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saab. Uh, um, I'm uh, grateful to you for providing me an opportunity to be a part of this wonderful uh, uh, learning and collaborative session, this webinar uh, on the role of the libraries in supporting uh, research 
uh, in universities and higher education institutions. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to appreciate the efforts of the library science department uh, under the leadership of Dr. Uh, Ruvina Bhatti. Uh, this is not the first such activity. I think it is the nth uh, in a series of activities that uh, she has been organizing um, uh, uh, for uh, enhancing the information and knowledge management uh, capabilities of uh, the Islamia University of Bahawalpur community with the participation of uh, uh, external uh, stakeholders and partners within our country and internationally. Uh, and uh, I would uh, sure hope that this uh, effort will continue and uh, Dr. Rubina and her team of uh, faculty members and staff members in the library science, library and information science department will continue this. And for today's seminar, I'm uh, extremely grateful to our uh, uh, guest speakers, invited speakers, the uh, subject matter experts, Dr. Joanna, uh, Dr. Naresh Agrawal, and Dr. Jesus. Uh, your talks were highly valuable. Uh, they were focused on uh, uh, sharing real world experiences. And uh, um, I, I would look forward to a long term association between yourself and the Islamia University of Bahawalpur community. So, so uh, once again, I would like to appreciate the effort of all the participants, uh, the presenters, and I'm sure the participants would have gained a lot of knowledge and information. And in this time of uh, the uh, international crisis, the pandemic of COVID-19, um, I'm so happy that as, as uh, innovative and creative human beings, we are keeping in touch with each other. Uh, we are able to communicate, uh, we are able to continue the business of our organizations and our uh, purpose of life. And hopefully this collaboration will eventually, this sharing of information and this uh, networking and linkages will uh, allow the, 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 the human community to overcome this uh, pandemic in, in, a, in, a, in a successful and a graceful manner and to prepare itself for future challenges of the same nature. So uh, thank you once again, and I'm all appreciation for all of you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rubina and the guest speakers. Thank you so much, Dr. Sir, for joining us. Here I want to say one thing, that this webinar is uh, from the platform of Sir Sajid Mahmoud the University Library, with collaboration of the parties. If you are goes to my library staff members, I have, uh, as I have taken charge as an additional librarian on 1st January, so my library staff members are here. So great, great. Members. Uh, so this is allow, allow me to uh, budget and uh, burden and and country contribute. I visited the library two weeks ago, and uh, when I saw and participated in the session, uh, the farewell session for uh, uh, the the chief librarian, uh, Dr. Tariq, I was uh, I was amazed at the wonderful community of library staff. The most uh, the helpful and friendly community that he had created, uh, which which was which really appeared like an island um, um, of uh, not just a, a team, but you know, uh, collaborating and um, loving workers uh, uh, who had uh, you know taken the library not just as a as a job or an assignment, but rather a mission and their passion. And I was truly impressed. And I would like uh, Dr. Chohan to to continue. Uh, to be a part of our team in the future so we can replicate this library and create a, a digital library and learning commons uh, in addition to this library because as you know the university is growing at a very fast pace and the current library physically will become um, a, a, a hindrance to accommodate the entire learners population and the new technologies of learning commons where each uh, uh, each room will be equipped with a uh, with a large uh, 60 or 70 inch uh, LED uh, with the soundproofing. So uh, eight to 10 students uh, and learners could learn together in a room and then we would have 50 or more of such rooms. And in addition, we would have all digital terminals for, to provide uh, access to digital information resources in an all digital library. So I, I feel that uh, the library and information science uh, department and the library forms a backbone for a community of learners and, and uh, Islamia University should invest more resources in it. And we will definitely raise those resources, invest in it for, the, uh, impro for improving the quality of our teaching, research and learning 
uh, at the Islamia University of Bahawalpur. Thank you so much. Thank you for your appreciation and motivation. And that's an obviously better. It's going to fulfill your vision, university's mission, and their, uh, your vision. Thank you so much. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Allah Hafiz. Walaikum salam. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Mehboob. Thank you so much for our international speakers and especially those who have joined us uh, from uh, USA and Mexico, Australia, uh, despite of the fact of the difference, of the very big difference of time zone. Uh, it's midnight at your place, but we are here in the afternoon. I appreciate your uh, wonderful presentation and ideas you have given us. And obviously, my library staff and my faculty members are here. And obviously, uh, we have learned a lot. And we will be in connect with you if you have any request you to join us in the future because I'm uh, planning to conduct a series of uh, webinars, symposium, and conference. Uh, uh, so please be part of, of us in the future too. And because my uh, purpose is to build the capacity of library staff, as well as attract library users, they, which are the faculty members, students, and university staff. And we have to um, make a good liaison with our publishers, community, funding agencies, and our Higher Education Commission for Community that give us more funds. So that activities would obviously help us to uh, convince them to spend more funds on the library and uh, for library research, research related services. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Joanna, Dr. Agarwal, and Professor Lau for your time and all your uh, wonderful presentation you made for now. For my university, library, and nature. Thank you so much, Professor Bhatti. It was wonderful. We will, be in contact. we will be in contact. I hope that I will have some other students who come back to you. So we will, have, we will be in the midnight and we will be in the morning. Mm -hmm. So we'll have such kind of webinar. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for the invitation. Greetings okay. to everyone. Thank you. Thank Adios. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye. Adios. 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 A very good night. Good night here. Good night. Almost night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the webinar concludes here. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for being the conductor of the program. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.